Right, good morning and welcome to the House Environment and Energy Committee. This morning we are taking up H-289 and act relating to the Renewable Energy Standard. We have Dave Moore with us from the Public Service Department. Welcome back. Thank you. For the record, TJ Poor, Director of Regulated Utility in the Public Service Department. Thank you for having me again. So um, I'm going to talk about our initial reactions to H289 today. But first, I'm really going to talk about balancing priorities and how the we think the Public Service Department's proposal is the proposal that best balances the priorities of Vermonters. I'll, uh, I'll then get into a little more detail than I provided last time about the community renewables program that we're proposing. And then if there's time, I'll provide a few, uh, some more specific comments about uh, certain line items and pieces of H-289. I'm sorry I don't have handouts for you today. Um, the, the printer uh, was not working at the office this morning, so we will be stuck with online. So I'm just gonna pull up the slides. <clears throat> okay, so um, I'm going to start with our uh, with environmental justice and equity today. And so, and I'm, I'm going to. I don't have pictured on the slide the energy plan. I talk about the energy plan a lot. Of course, that is centered around equity, and it's one of the themes of the energy plan. But also, the climate action plan uh, and the environmental justice legislation that was passed in uh, 2022. F 154 of that year, both call for Vermonters to be part of determining solutions um, to our climate and energy needs. And uh, the Public Service Department's proposal has really carried that principle forward in both engagement prior to the proposal and in the process uh, that we're proposing, sorry, for uh, community renewables. Uh, and specifically, the, the Climate Action Plan calls on, uh, you know, Vermonters must be part of not only the solutions, but in determining them. We want to make policy with Vermonters, not just for them. Uh, the guiding principles adopted by the Council uh, include ensuring inclusive, transparent, and innovative engagement in the development of the plan and policies program, uh, and moving at the speed of trust. So if we don't take what so we think that the department's process has been uh, a, a, at least a very good attempt um, at ensuring inclusive trans uh, and transparent engagement. And we're worried that if we don't, if, if the participants in that process don't actually see uh, their recommendations and the results of it uh, put forth in policy, that they're going to be disillusioned. We're not going to be moving with their trust at all. Um, and then um, specifically Act 154 called for meaningful participation of all individuals. And really, we, we really think our proposal hit these marks as best we could in the 18 months that we moved forward. And uh, this has been kind of core to how we've been thinking about moving forward here. Um, I want to, I, I know I showed a couple of these slides. I'll just go quickly on a couple of these slides about what uh, Vermonters said about their priorities. Um, and in short, it's affordability, reducing carbon emissions, and reliability. Uh, that you can see that those are, when asked what your single most prior, uh, highest priority is, those are the three highest priorities. Point out that whether the source is produced in state, uh, is down near the bottom of somebody's highest priority. Um, and that is both uh, the initial survey of 700 participants and then a follow-up survey in focus groups. Uh, also, in addition to the uh, affordability, uh, reliability, and emissions, they want to ensure access. This was uh, focus groups, uh, our regional planning commission events. We heard this a lot. Vermonters are really concerned about their neighbors, um, tying that back to affordability and the affordability of our climate policies for their neighbors. And they overwhelmingly want to ensure that our policies are designed to help provide help for disadvantaged uh, communities or 
uh, support for community solar, which is kind of the uh, the how uh, how community renewables and community access is presented to us a lot is in the form of community solar. Representative Smith. Thank you. Has there been a lot of, well, so lack of support for disadvantaged Vermonters? Is there, um, has there been a lack of support for disadvantaged Vermonters? You mean in our current policies, our current well, renewable energy policies? Overall, I mean, are there people in the in back road somewhere that aren't getting any attention? Or? Well, I think um, our policies, I'll use net metering as an example, um, is uh, net metering is paid for by all rate payers. And um, really those, for the most part, those who have um, the wherewithal to sign up for net metering, whether it's the funding, the financing, or just like the skills to be able to, in the time capacity to actually sign up for a group net metering system, those are the ones that are um, benefiting. And those who do not fall into those categories of having the funding, financing, and wherewithal uh, time and capacity to, to do it, um, those are the ones who are paying. And that is disproportionately um, lower income that are paying. And so I think there is some of our policies are not equitably distributing the benefits and burdens. Thank you. Okay, I said I would go quickly on those two slides. Um, so I'm gonna go to the affordability priority. So this chart on the left you, you saw last time, which is the uh, average projected rate increase incremental from the scenarios we analyzed in the technical analysis. And you see those scenarios are anywhere from three to 5% uh, average rate impact over time. And I circled scenario two, um, uh, Mr. Sterling last week, or maybe it was the week before when he's testifying, also kind of circled scenario two as saying that's the one that's kind of like H-289. It's not exactly like that. And I'll get into a little bit of differences, but so I'm just using that one as an example here. Um, and so that's a, you know, 5% rate impact from the modeling that was done with a stakeholder advisory group that included REV and a number of uh, broad array of stakeholders. Um, and that, what that equates to is $800 million over 10 years. So, um, you know, 10 years, if our revenue is a billion to a billion and a half dollars a year, um, you know, so we're like talking about 10 to $15 billion, $800 million um, is, is what that equates to in terms of uh, what that scenario is. Um, and those are costs above the benefits. So net cost to Vermont ratepayers. It does not account, account for the social cost of carbon in this analysis. We talked about that last time, social, social benefits, Vermont costs. Um, but it, uh, and it doesn't account, you know, cost reductions to Massachusetts or Connecticut, but it's the, um, the costs and benefits that hit Vermonters pocketbooks. 800 million over 10 years is what the model said. Now, you did. We have a question from Representative Civilian. Do you want to do question? I'm sorry, actually. Do you want to? I, it's, up to it's up to you. Okay. TJ. Let me just say one more thing and then, um, and then we'll start to. Um, now, I actually don't think that that scenario lines up exactly with $800 million. There's a number of, uh, uh, carve outs and different provisions that are different than the scenario modeling. So I wanted to just take, um, you know, uh, a, a big haircut from that $800 million net cost. And so let's say it's, say we're off, say it costs $500 million over 10 years. Well, what does that $500 million buy us if we were to kind of put it into other things? It could buy us $5,000 incentive for 100,000 vehicles or it could buy us 50,000 homes weatherized over the next 10 years. So we're, we're doing that stuff. You, as a legislative body, have decided to move forward with a clean heat standard. We're already moving um, on the thermal sector. We have transportation incentives uh, as well. 
but this is another $500 million on top of what we're already doing. And so I, I just want to make that really clear on what, what the H289 is, is spending. And there's a range of options. I'm not saying 800 million is the number. I'm not saying $500 million is the number, but it's, there's, there's a significant cost to, uh, to H289. Um, I, I will one more slide and then questions because this is uh, uh, really relevant and this is a quick one. And those costs in the model also don't, um, I, I've mentioned this before and been very clear about this. They don't account for costs to the transmission and distribution system um, necessary to create headroom for all of that other generation. So there's no costs there associated with that. Today, and I think the reason they're not testifying today, Belco is presenting kind of the draft results of their long range transmission plan, where um, there's some emerging information and data showing that there are significant transmission costs to getting uh, the amount of solar that would be likely to be cited under a 20% tier two. Um, our proposal really mitigates these costs. Um, the Velco will be in on Friday, and I think it's appropriate for them to talk about that. But I just wanted to be clear that the cost structure we're talking about does not account for this additional impact. Um, Velco will only talk about the transmission sector. On the distribution side, there are, um, there are also costs. Um, and so we're, we're still trying to work with GMP and VEC at least to get a sense of what those costs are. Um, but again, our proposal will mitigate um, those on both the distribution and the transmission. So that's my last point on cost. So now might be a good time. To... Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so just one question around uh, the uh, <clears throat> working group proposal um, proposes to eliminate group net metering. How does that factor into your uh, projected cost, DJ? So in the uh, in the scenarios that reduces the amount of net metering and the higher costs that are in the model, um, those costs in the model were declining already. So group net metering, uh, and, and the way that's shown in the model is by uh, the amount of megawatts that are assumed to be developed by net metering. And those are were assumed to be declining even in the business as usual, because the um, the cost structure of group net metering. I think um, I, I think it's been said here before by others than me that there are less and less group net metering projects already being proposed now um, because of the cost structure isn't quite working out. And so, um, so with that the case. Removing group net metering definitely helps, but it doesn't help as much as you would think. It, it I would say it helps on the order of, um, but when, when I did it for our proposal, it was like a 25 to 50 million out of the, out of the 500 to 800 million. So savings. it was savings. Yeah. So it was, you could reduce those costs by like $25 million for you know, over 10 years, over 10 years. Because you're still replacing that. So instead of 14 cent power or 12 cent power, which group net metering, all excess generation is around that range, um, it, you're at 11 cents. So it's a, that three cents a megawatt hour difference for the amount of group net metering, which was already assumed to be declining. So that's why it's kind of a small, it's a savings and $25 million, $50 million is real but it is not as big as I thought it was going to be. It's one way I think. That might be obvious, but just what is driving those costs to be significantly different? Well, I don't know if they are significantly different from the other scenarios, but what's driving those 5% costs? Uh, it is the cost of the power that is above what is uh, above the value of the power. So um, if it, in the model, we, um, based on recommendations from, um, from our stakeholders, changed the model to have it have the cost for 
solar be um, around 10 and a half cents to 11 cents uh, per kilowatt hour for larger solar, you know, above 500 kW to up to five megawatts. Um, and so, but the market value of that um, is, uh, is lower. It's, um, <clears throat> the energy value assumed in the model has it being between three and five cents. And then you have a capacity value on top of that. And you have some avoided transmission, which is small because our transmission charges are, are uh, incurred based on our monthly peak load, which happens at night now. And so, um, so the value proposition for that energy, like when it's being produced, it's kind of at the lower value times. Um, if you look at um, if you look at market costs, and I I don't have a slide with me, I, I could pull it up and take a little too long. But in our annual energy report, um, which uh, we sent in uh, last week, there is a comparison. There's a, there's a graph with the wholesale market energy prices by month over time. And you'll see in the winter, prices are really high, in the, especially in the shoulder months when April to May to June. Uh, and then in, in the fall, prices are really low. And so that solar is generating at, um, at the lowest value times. And so that's, that's how it's kind of framed in the model is like, well, utilities could otherwise purchase this energy for this cost. And that increment is the above market cost that is represented here. Representative Tory. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing this and all your good work on the engagement. I think that it really stands out how much participation and input you got. Um, but I do have a question for you about within this 10 years, um, what we can expect to happen from an investment in storage, for example. Um, and the fact that we're talking about an, a dynamic energy system that's changing. Um, I know Connecticut is, is pretty all in right now on storage. Um, and with the amount of funding available from the feds, that could be true for Vermont at some point as well. Um, do you have any thoughts about, you know, what, or any insight into what kinds of rate impacts a more dynamic pricing experience because of storage, the opportunities that's going to open up, what that could look like for rate payers. Yeah, so a few things. Um, one, um, in terms of the federal funding, the department has put into uh, a competitive solicitation for $100 million um, for storage. Uh, in partnership with all of our distribution and transmission utilities. And so we are looking and trying to take advantage of those, um, uh, those opportunities. Uh, there's a value proposition now for storage. Um, it, and that value proposition is, well, we can avoid, um, there's, there's a, a number of values you can stack, just like with any resource. We can avoid some peak costs. We can avoid, maybe we can avoid some infrastructure costs. Um, we could avoid, um, and, you know, arbitraging energy is, uh, is challenging, a little more challenging, right? Because those differences are not within an hour. Sometimes they are, but the ones, the, the large scale ones that I was talking about with high prices in the winter and lots of generation in the summer, storage is a lot shorter duration and it's not gonna really help with that. Um, I don't wanna, um, though, we, I think we need to be careful about um, saying, well, um, if we pass a res that requires storage, then storage will then have a value proposition because we don't want to, we don't want to create a policy that creates a problem that we need another policy to fix. And so, I think we need to be a little bit careful about just saying we can, we can um, solve all this with storage. I'm going to skip ahead really quickly because I brought a couple additional slides. Just to, I haven't shared these with you. Um, this is where we are with storage right now, um, and the storage comes up a lot in this committee. So. 
Right now we have about 55 megawatts of operational storage and on average that is three hours, uh, um, three hours per megawatt. So 154 megawatt hours of storage. There's another 20 megawatts under development in specific dockets. And then also residential storage added every month with uh, buyer utilities. So say those numbers again, maybe slower because you're used to them, but we're not. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> So we have about uh, 54 megawatts of storage that's operational. Yeah. In, in context, our, uh, well, and another 20 that are under development in different dockets. And so this is the list here. Uh, the top half are operational. The bottom half in italics are under development. So about 74 megawatts worth of storage total. Um, and storage, you gave a really nice how long it lasts. What do we get for that story? Um, about three hours. If you've turned it all on at once, you have three hours with that 74 megawatts. <clears throat> for the whole? Well, and then Vermont. for all Vermont, yes. Yeah. So that is, so just 74 megawatts in context is about 10% of Vermont's um, peak last year. So we're at about 10%. If we're just looking at our peak load, about 10%. And we put together um, a summary of some of the goals and uh, in other states. And so what we have, um, Connecticut was mentioned. There's um, there's a goal and milestone out here. They have um, 12 megawatts of storage deployed 2023. They're at 0.2% of their current peak. Maine has a target. Um, they have about 63 megawatts of storage deployed, about 3.6%. Massachusetts, 0.7%. Vermont, if you um, if you count the 20 megawatts under development, we're at 10.3% already of storage. So storage value proposition as it is, is, is working. We're, we're deploying storage. Um, and then the last thing I'll stay on storage um, is that we also need to be careful of if we are, if we decide to use storage to um, kind of better gain value with our energy system and do energy arbitrage, then we may not have it available for a use case for outages or for frequency regulation, which, uh, which it provides a value for, making sure the system's balanced all at once, or any of the other use cases, avoiding transmission costs. And so we gotta make sure we don't double count those. We do a few questions. Uh, Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your presentation too. The question I have is, has there, was there any discussion about what the impact would be on electric rates over the next 10 years? Um, can you say that? I couldn't hear you. As, a discussion about what electric rates would be over, over 10 years, what the impact would be over the next 10 years? For the H289? Yeah. So that's the... Um, the slide that I was talking about here, it, it's, you know, three to um, three to five percent um, seems like a small percentage, but um, that scenario too was $800 million to electric rates. Um, and so, you know, like I said, it may be $500 million when you um, adjust for all the carve outs and different, different pieces. Thank you. Representative Stevens. Um, so I have three questions. Uh, the first relates to what you just said, just so the committee has a sense, and I'm not discounting that there is a cost to everything, um, and that 5% uh, over 10 years is um, not important. But could you give the committee uh, a sense of what we've been seeing in terms of rate increases um, from different utilities over the last year or two? Sure. Uh, yeah, there have been rate increases in the five to ten percent range. There's been requests for over ten percent um, in the last few years as markets um, have, especially when markets spiked in 2022 and the open position, any open positions that utilities had where they were not already hedged with power, they needed to cover those at higher rates, and so there were rate increases. Thanks. I just, uh, for me, when I hear 5%, I'm like, well, how does that compare to other things that are going on? Yeah. Um, my second question, so storage, my, I've thrown a few bills at the wall. Um, for me, the, the 
the storage piece, like I keep thinking about the communities that go out of power for a full week in Christmas of last year. And for me, storage, um, I did not know those stats. Thanks for that. Uh, for me, it feels um, uh, not necessarily, it feels like each utility has sort of their storage goals that they probably put into their planning processes. But as someone not deeply involved in that, um, for me, it feels like, is the storage going where we need it? Um, and that's the part where I keep thinking from a, yes, there is the resiliency. If you have storage and you combine it with solar, then you can reduce costs depending on how things are structured. But there's also just the resiliency of like, if we're having more winter storms or having more flooding um, and power is cut or whatever, do you feel like our approach to storage right now, which is sort of, I would say utility driven and then perhaps somewhat developer driven um, and homeowner driven, is there a plan there? Is that is storage going where it, we really need it to be? Not that we don't need it a lot, but I just feel like that that's the piece that's missing for me when I think of rural communities that are stuck for a mm -hmm. week. It'd be great to have storage and solar, or sto you know, a big F100 lightning right there to plug in so people can, you know, have a backup. Yeah, I think that we um, we're heading in that direction. Um, right now, storage is is penciling out on the kind of cost benefit um, evaluation for a lot of in a lot of use cases. That doesn't necessarily include the use case that you're talking about. And um, we need to um, find a, a way to value that a little more clearly so that we can um, we can ensure that the projects are going where they need to go. There is a lot of work being done with the Climate Council on a municipal vulnerability index, which will, um, will also, I think, highlight um, other locations or, or locations where storage and would be most valuable and start to help to direct us to uh, point in that direction. Thanks. And my last question, which maybe if we have time, you can touch on it <clears throat> at the tail end when you've finished. Um, I am aware of some of the things the department um, slash clean energy development fund are, are going for in terms of grants at the federal level, but I, I don't really know the full gamut. Um, so just wondering if you could give a, you know, a high level summary of like, these are the five grants we went for, just so we're aware. And so that we can see whether or not the policies that we're working on are supportive or not. Sure. I, um, do you want me to wait to do that or? To... Well, I definitely want you to get to what you came to share with us today. Okay. Reminds me that the question that I wanted to ask you was about solar for all and helping us understand that because it's come up a lot in our conversations. I think it's related to Rep. Stevens' question. So I hope there's time. Yeah. Um, Representative Sebelia. Yeah, just terminology, actually, <clears throat> going back to the storage and you were talking about the use case. Can you just, for us mere lay people, explain what that Yeah, so um, thanks. I, uh, I, I use that term to just say this is what we're using the storage or the resource for in this instance. So if we are using storage to avoid our transmission peaks, will it be also available to um, help us um, better manage supply and demand with our generation supply, uh, generation and demand imbalance? And that's a different use case, right? Um, a different use case is balancing the system regionally to help make sure that supply and demand are matched up as, as part of um, ice on New England. And so um, when I say use case, I just mean like different ways that you can use the storage and those value propositions and they interact. And so you can't count 100% of the benefits for each one because they might overlap and one might eat into another. So that's proposed by each utility? Uh, when they're proposing storage, they'll say what this is how we're going to use it, and this is the value proposition. Yes. That's all. Thank you. Representative Pat. 
just something you said. I mean, if if a uh, if if a storage facility, whether it's you know a, a home storage facility or a, a, a larger scale uh, facility, if it is get, ends up being used uh, for an extended outage, uh, and and it may not last for, you know, for for the total amount of the extended outage, that then would not since it. How would that affect the, I mean, the power supply and the power supply cost of the utility that would otherwise be using it as part of their energy supply um, to to customers? When in in this case, that's not what's happening during during an outage. Uh, yeah. So my point is really that the the different use cases interact, and you can't just say that. Um, well, we get 100% of the value from avoiding outages and 100% of the value from using it for frequency regulation and 100% of the value elsewhere. In one instance, you know, that that utility is not paying for power supply at all in that instance because there's an outage, right? <laughs> um, and so um, the battery hasn't provided any value there in terms of power supply, but it may have provided value to the customer. And so you, you just can't count both of those values. So at the same time. At the same time. Okay, so um, emissions was uh, described as a as a, another priority. Um, just doing a time check. Uh, okay. Emissions was another priority of Vermonters, and so I want to just bring us back to our starting point of what our current portfolio is. On the left hand side of this chart, you see our physical deliveries. That's just our contracts. I use the word entitlements. What? You know, utilities either own or contract for power, and so they are entitled to that energy, regardless of the attributes of it. Um, this is, uh, on the left-hand side, this is what they were, utilities were entitled to in Vermont for 20, 2022. Um, you can see that 65% of it came from renewable resources, and the additional 21% came from nuclear. On the right-hand side is the after we account for the attributes and who owns the actual environmental credits associated with those. And so the mix changes, but overall we're 90% emissions free. This is what, um, this is what how uh, our greenhouse gas inventory currently tracks our emissions and how our um, requirements towards our GWSA goal, Global Warming Solutions Act goals, are tracked and met. So we're, we're starting from a spot where we are 90% emissions free. Now, um, um, both as counted by that greenhouse gas inventory, both the Public Service Department and H-289 proposals are have the exact same impact. So there's no emissions difference as it relates to our GWSA goals. So um, both proposals close the gap from 90% non-emitting currently to 100% non-emitting by 2030. And that's done through the trading of those renewable energy credits and nuclear attributes. But the, so emissions was a priority and affordability was a priority. They have this, both proposals have the same exact emissions impact and the public service department proposal is much more affordable. Can I ask you a question on affordability? Um, the 5% on a, on a bill, on the average bill, what is that? Uh, well, it depends on what your bill is. I, I mean, if you, um, if you just say your bill is $100, that's in a month, you're at $5 a month, right? $60 a year over 10 years, $600, $600 that you, um, an individual who you, has a $100 bill uh, is paying. Um, did not mean to hit that button. Okay, so the, there is an emissions impact difference societally though. And um, I, I know that um, I think there's not, there's not any uh, disagreement here that the only societal emissions impact is from when you add new renewable generation. 
And so uh, um, the department's in agreement, I think, with, with everybody. I haven't heard anybody say anything different. The only time you actually societally make a difference to emissions is when you add something new, and then now you're avoiding um, usually whatever is on the margin in ISO New England, usually a natural gas generating plant. And so the difference in our proposal societally, so this top bullet is Vermont difference as we track to the Glo Global Warming Solutions Act and our requirements. This bottom bullet is societally the difference. And it's the difference between 30% new renewables in the department's proposal and 40% new renewables. And those are rough numbers with the carve outs and different nuance to both the proposals. So it's not exact, but um, so we're talking about um, a 10% difference uh, of new renewables. Um, and just a, a reminder, again, our greenhouse gas inventory, there's a slide at the end of the deck, I won't scroll to it, it just shows our greenhouse gas inventory. The electric sector is a really tiny portion of the state's emissions as we track to those GWSA requirements. Wow. Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. I help me understand what a societal emission is versus just a emissions. Right. So um, it's a very good question, and I, I take it for granted a lot. Um, so I, I often, and the energy plan calls for this, and so the department does analysis based on what the impact to Vermont is and our borders. And so draw the borders of the analysis around Vermont. And then we take a broader look and say, what's the impact to society? Right. We don't have any natural gas generating plants in Vermont. But when, because we're part of ISO New England, um, if we add new generation somewhere in New England, we're going to reduce a natural gas plant somewhere in New England. Those benefits don't accrue to Vermont directly. And so they don't count in our, in the rate impact that I showed you, for instance, but they, they do, um, they do count for society. Like we've stopped a certain amount of emissions going into the atmosphere. And so they, um, so that's the difference is kind of the scope of the analysis from global and societal to um, to Vermont specific. And it's important for us to evaluate uh, both things. Um, what I said last time uh, when I was talking about the economics of, of these proposals is that all of the scenarios we evaluated had a societal benefit when you count those emissions benefits that accrue to you know, helping helping reduce sea level rise, um, other you know climate change impacts, reducing natural disasters, um, but they come at a cost to Vermont ratepayers, and that's the trade off we we have to balance. Right, um, is how much does Vermont pay for those societal benefits? And I think my point here on this slide is that there's a significant difference in how much Vermont pays with the two proposals and not that much of a significant difference in how much emissions are reduced society. How do you account for societal costs of say, disposing of nuclear waste? Because the two scenarios use nuclear what significantly differently, right? I mean. Yes, uh, so those are, those they both assume that nuclear is included in the business as usual. So there's um, no, there's no difference. Um, nuclear remains a part of New England's power portfolio, and so there's no difference in the two cases. In so, the same amount? Yes. Um, nuclear is a is a you know a baseload resource. There's there's a plant in Connecticut called the Yellowstone Generating Plant, and um, they need to be relicensed in the next uh, couple of years by FERC. And right now there's a regional discussion going on as to, um, you know, the owners of that plant um, are you know, saying, well, we don't know if it's worth it to actually relicense. And ISO New England, the New England states are saying, this provides a real reliability benefit. It's baseload power. We, we need to talk about keeping you around and keeping you operating. There's a net, and so those are, you know, discussions that are happening. There's nothing super solid, um, but 
what's happened in the last two years is that there's the Mystic Generating Stations, a natural gas plant, another baseload power plant that is uh, in Connecticut also. They were going to retire. And ISO New England said, no, we, um, we need this plant for reliability. And so we are going to pay you anything above market to, that you need to stay online. And so whatever they got from selling their energy, they got, and then they sent ISO New England what it cost to operate, and ISO New England sent them a check for the difference, and ratepayers paid for that. And it was significant, like regionally, hundreds of millions of dollars. Representative Tory. Yeah, regionally, I was just curious, um, the other New England states, do they consider nuclear renewable? Uh, not renewable, no, but uh, they include it, uh, Massachusetts in particular specifically includes it in their clean CESE, it's their clean energy standard existing, and they're, um, they um, specifically uh, allow nuclear, um, and I believe, um, I'm not sure about Connecticut. I think Connecticut is uh, on that track with the clean, clean energy procurements as well. And so, in, in the department's proposal doesn't define that as renewable. It's not a renewable resource, it, but it does, um, it does call it, um, quote, unquote, clean, um, at least as far as uh, emissions at the point of combustion. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to access and the other things that we really heard. We touched on reliability with some of the nuclear, but I focused on that last time. So I'm gonna go to access. And so just wanna, um, I have listened to a lot of the discussions or you know, gotten notes from the discussions and um, I wanna be clear that net metering is not necessary to ensure access. Net metering is a program that we've constructed to deliver, um, to allow for self-generation and group net metering, et cetera. Um, the department's proposal says, well, net metering should continue, but we should compensate it um, to avoid cross subsidies. And uh, to do that, we um, our proposal is to compensate the excess generation at avoided cost. So excess generation means any generation beyond which is used on site. Okay, so anything that's exported onto the grid and avoided cost is what utilities could otherwise buy it for. So our proposal is to compensate net metering what's not used on site as uh, at what utilities could otherwise buy it for. Um, so without, without the subsidies that are currently there, um, our that portion of the proposal is estimated to effectively uh, end group net metering. The word end should be in there um, right now, or effectively eliminate new group net metering for projects. But if rates were to increase, like the wholesale market rates increase, then our proposal also allows group net metering to continue to exist and to be an option. And there wouldn't be cross subsidy because the rates would support it. What utilities could otherwise purchase the power for would support group net metering. So it's a little more nimble in that respect. Um, uh, and so both, both our proposal and H289 effectively do right now eliminate group net metering. But I'll talk about it in a second. Our proposal actually seeks to replace it with a more cost-effective mechanism to ensure access to communities. And that's not, uh, our goal is to provide that access at least cost. That doesn't necessarily mean least cost generation because um, it's gonna cost more than what utilities could otherwise buy it for, but it's gonna cost less than group net metering as it currently exists. Um, and then uh, just another note, because I've heard it here that the, effective elimination of group net metering in our proposal or the explicit elimination of group net metering in the H289 um, doesn't affect the solar for all proposal that we submitted to the environmental protection. Act. So we submitted a $100 million proposal that had three or parts to it. Um, one part was to support 
self-generation from uh, on-site net metering, single-family net metering for low-income customers. Um, another part is to uh, support the pilots that utilities are already now undertaking with $10 million of ARPA money in what we call the Affordable Clean, sorry, the Affordable Community Renewable Energy Program. That um, and to expand that program, which it's an ARPA program, so it's COVID relief dollars, provides bill credits to customers um, in, in a form of, uh, provides bill credits through giving them ownership of a portion of a solar plant. Um, and there's a lot of different flavors that we're piloting. That uh, the third portion and the, mo the biggest one is to support solar development on affordable housing or with affordable housing. And there is flexibility in the way that we propose that. Group net metering could be an option to deliver that, or you could do it in a more cost-effective way through utility procurement, a statewide procurement, or otherwise, um, otherwise support solar on affordable housing. It is not limited to group net metering. Proposal. Um, is there one more in your? Oh, there's three. Those are the three parts of your solar for all. Those are the three parts of the solar for all. So yeah. Representative Stebbins and then Sabilia. Uh, the department's proposal <clears throat> related to uh, what isn't group net metering. Um, it still has to be all on site. So we heard testimony. At least that's what it sounds like. Uh, we heard testimony from one affordable housing um, builder who said, we can only build this much on site and, you know, a block away, there's affordable land. So would your proposal allow for, you know, or, or a community, like let's say a community wants to do solar on their municipal rooftop, but then they run out and they still want to actually, you know, try to get as much solar to offset their typical daily load um, and demand. What does your proposal allow for, hey, we ran out of space, so this does make sense for us to go somewhere else where we also have land? Explicitly, yes. Okay. That was my first question. My second question is, again, this is a context question. If we're running out of time, we can skip it. Um, but I just, my understanding is that there are lots of um, cross subsidies within rate making and electricity design and, you know, fossil fuels compared to electricity. Um, I always struggle when I only see one type that is highlighted. So um, if we have time, if you could touch for a minute on some of the other cross subsidies that are out there that we all pay for and we don't highlight repeatedly in policy making. Sure, um, I'm gonna hold on that one. Okay. And um, because your first question, I want to um, really describe the concept um, in what would replace um, group net metering here. And so we've tentatively named this the uh, Renewable Energy for Communities Program, RE4C. Um, suggestions on the name are welcome. Uh, what our, the proposal would do would be to require utilities to issue solicitations for community energy systems that meet a number of objectives that would be laid out in statute. It would deliver benefits to uh, it, uh, meet the objectives of delivering benefits, excuse me, to customers who have historically been marginalized or faced with inequitable access to benefits of renewable energy. This is in line with um, environmental justice legislation. Um, supporting community participation and development and governance of distributed generation, support tenants, affordable housing buildings, and support benefits to school and municipal buildings. So um, community, um, really community focused utilities would require to, to be solicit a certain amount of energy over, over the 10 years that the program covers. Um, that, that energy could be, um, you know, it's not size restricted. So one of the reasons that this can be more cost effective than net metering is that it could be a larger project that is off site um, up to five megawatts and um, that affordable housing could or other community focused projects could take advantage of those economies of scale. 
Um, in terms of process, we uh, would recommend a process that um, where we undertake a stakeholder engagement effort so that we actually develop the details of this program design and how the mechanics of it would work with the communities that would be affected by the program themselves. So we don't want to just say, hey, we're going to do a utility solicitation. We're going to design that here. Hope it works for you. We're going to, we want to take some time to actually say what is going to work for you and to be able to respond to a solicitation uh, and have successful projects deliver, uh, deliver power under this program. Then we would submit that to the Public Utility Commission, and they would, by rule or order, actually um, actually implement the program, which would would be the actual requirement for utilities to um, to solicit this power. Um, really, this allows utilities to tailor solicitations to build utilities where there's room on the grid and that generate at times when energy is needed. Um, that on the utility side, it helps contain both power supply and transmission distribution costs. Uh, on the community side, it allows communities to take advantage of economies of scale, participate in a way that uh, is more cost effective for ratepayers, uh, and um, uh, and delivers the same or similar benefits. Representative Logan, then Pat. Thank you, Chair. Um, Thanks, TJ. Um, really appreciate this proposal. Um, I'm curious if you all have thought about ways in which this could potentially um, benefit tenants. Um, and I mean, one of the issues that we're facing with tenants and um, is the split incentive typically that there is between a landlord and the tenant. It seems like this has the potential to benefit tenants of, you know, that are um, leasing directly from private landlords as well. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so, well, I think um, that does have that benefit and we can decide in the design of the program how much to focus on different groups whether it is just tenants of affordable housing or if there are objectives we want to recommend to support tenants um, of landlords that don't otherwise have access and so i think there's room in the design of this program if we can lay out the parameters the broad parameters and the objectives of what we want to accomplish with the program, then there's there's room for um, really designing it in a way that supports um, supports those goals and actually um, uh, gets to where we want to go. We don't want to over design it in legislation here in the committee room or in the hallways because I think that we we, we would miss something. But not all the right folks are around the table, um, and so um, there there is room for that. Um, the other thing I'll just say is, you know, net metering, as I understand it now, especially for her, um, affordable housing folks, net metering works for them, right? Like, and so the way I think about net metering, it's, it is like a contract. They're getting a certain amount per kilowatt hour for every, every uh, <clears throat> kilowatt hour they generate. And so um, they may get less per kilowatt hour for the number of kilowatt hours they generate, but because of economies of scale, the efficiencies of this utility solicitation where it's going in spots where the grid can handle it, that reduce the cost. So the, the margin that they're getting could, um, it could still be the same. And so we want to um, support affordable housing to, uh, you know, and, and we want to, just like we want to support all communities, uh, to ensure that the benefits of renewable generation are actually distributed more equitably. And I think this is a way to do that and actually just reduce costs to the other ratepayers who are paying for that. Representative Pat. Uh, yeah, my, my question is how, how do you, um, when you say uh, require utilities to issue solicitations, do you have a sense of how you would determine like how, how much of, uh, 
particular utility is expected to solicit for. Um, and, and then once the proposals come in, uh, if, is there a way, would you, what if the proposals come in at a very high cost? Um, uh, is that uh, uh, what what happens then? And also, again, with net metering in general, what if this is um, uh, simply uh, displacing power that the, that the utility already has? Yeah. So, um, so a few quite a few pieces there. I think one, the starting point would be. Um, and and I think a lot of this can be in the design details, so I, I, none of this is is rock solid. But I would start with a spot of a pro rata share of the whatever the requirement ultimately is is the requirement for each utility. That said, I think that for uh, hundred percent uh, renewable utilities that are desi designated in both H two eighty nine and the department's proposal, um, the new required capacity could be limited to the um, to the load growth. Um, so uh, to requirements associated with their load growth. And so um, so there that I think answers part of your third question or is one potential solution there. Um, and I think there still would be an alternative compliance payment. Um, so that would cap um, the maximum. But I think utilities could um, coordinate on their solicitations. They could, you know, it doesn't have to just be one small utility. BEPSA could coordinate or, um, you know, the co-ops could coordinate and that may provide like a, a bigger scope to provide the best project, get the best projects that help the most people. And so um, I do think some cost containment provisions are appropriate. Uh, and uh, those are a couple of possible ways to get to them. Representative Tory, <clears throat> this is making me think um, that plant is going to be really important, like energy shed plant, with the, on the community level. Um, just like we talk in this committee about watershed planning in the face of uh, all the risks um, from flooding. Do you have some thoughts about how to just grow? Uh, the uh, capacity to plan on that level? Yeah, I think the regional planning commissions are doing a really good job right now in planning and helping municipalities plan. There are a lot of municipalities that don't have energy plans still. Uh, I think we're, they're um, getting um, knocked off slowly and surely. Um, you know, my hometown of Pittsburgh uh, is, is developing an energy plan now, which is exciting. Um, where I grew up, but they, um, um, you know, one of the uh, objectives or provisions in this program could be to um, support projects that uh, on locations that have been designated by the regional plans or the um, towns, town plans. And so that would then provide another connection to the community saying, this is where we want our uh, our renewable energy to be located, and that could um, that could be a avenue to get it there. So um, that largely finishes. Well, I, I, maybe not quite. Um, it, how much more time? It's ten o'clock. So. I mean, we can go ten more minutes. Okay. So um, we like our proposal. <laughs> we think it best balances uh, Vermonter's priorities as evidenced by the stakeholder engagement that we went through. Uh, and our proposal is supported by the kind of the procedural equity components of the environmental justice law that we went through to, um, to develop it. Um, I put in here just a reminder of what our actual proposal is, um, because it was a few weeks ago. Maybe I should have started with this. Um, again, it's a hundred percent clean energy standard. Within that, thirty percent new, half of which is from um, distributed generation connected to the Vermont grid. So, like tier two, it's you can think about it in terms of it's a fifteen percent tier two by twenty thirty five and a thirty percent 
uh, overall new re renewable tier um, by, by 2035, so anywhere in New England. The current 75% renewable uh, tier one target would remain. And then um, I, I should mention our additional study and reporting requirements to just to understand better impacts to the T&D system. It's, it's not only impacts here, which is written on the slide, but it's also solutions. Um, so that study wouldn't just, you know, Velco is going to talk again about on Friday impacts to the transmission grid. Utilities should be talking about impacts to the distribution grid. Well, we want to. So those impacts, I think, are are fairly well defined, and the study really would take that, you know, due dil diligence on what those impacts are, what otherwise would have happened anyway, et cetera. But then also look at solutions. Can curtailment help? Can load flexibility help? Can storage, as part of load flexibility, help? And what does that cost? And then the other study is for more granular reporting to better match that supply and demand over, uh, you know, quarterly. Um, so I have some more specific comments on H289 uh, I could go into. I, that was an hour of pretty high level, um, and I, I'm just going to pause for questions. So. Okay. So um, this one's still a little level. Mm -hmm. I think the H289 is overcomplicated. Um, one, there's provisions in there that I read 15 times and I still didn't understand actually what they were doing. But, um, but at a higher level, it creates not just one renewable energy standard, but several different renewable energy standards. There's one for GMP, there's one for global foundries, there's one for VIPSA utilities or small munis, there's one for 100% utilities. It's, you know, and, and the department's proposal has some carve outs too, don't get me wrong, but the, the H. 289 is very uh, choose your own adventure. And I don't know how I'd explain to my regional counterparts that say, hey, we're at 30% um, by 2035. What, are you, what is Vermont's um, renewable policy land us at? I, I don't know, somewhere between 30 and 40%, maybe. I, uh, I am still looking into that, but I actually don't know. And so our the department's proposals a little simpler, and I think there's a lot of value in that in not only administering the program, the compliance and verification it is going to be a challenge for the department under H289, but also um, but also communicating it to Vermonters and how Vermonters kind of interact with their energy policy. When we did our webinars a year ago, you know, it was basic like what's a renewable energy credit, what is a megawatt hour, what is a megawatt, and what's in-state generation and how come we don't count kind of the dams on the Connecticut River as Vermont and, you know, questions like that. If we are really going choose your own adventure route, uh, Vermonters are going to be even more disengaged with their electric supply, I think. Um, there are, I have some specific concerns about the net metering language that, uh, you know, as it's written, um, group net metering I, I know this isn't the intent, so I assume that this could be uh, changed, but um, it may still be allowed as written. And it's kind of a question if uh, a system uh, could still have its credits allocated to multiple offsite meters. When legislation is written, our current net metering paradigm relies on more than one meter. And the, the language in the bill is very specific to um, limiting group net metering to um, it, it, it's very specific around metering. And so there's a, I think there's easier ways to get it all there. Just a quick question uh, on your slide alternative, which you're probably getting to, I probably preempted you here, but what is DG? Oh, distributed generation, sorry. Um, should talk faster, I guess. Um, we do have some concern about letting utilities sell attributes for older net metering generation that a customer owns. Uh, you know, it that it's um, customers who have that older generation are expecting to own their net metering credits, and if utilities can now sell those, one they're not really well tracked, um, as far as I can tell, and um, and two. 
you know, it, yes, I think a utility could go and say, um, you know, get an agreement from a customer to say, um, we're now going to sell your RECs, um, your renewable energy credits. But I don't believe that um, just going ahead and doing that is appropriate when customers had a value proposition um, 10 years ago and thought they owned the attributes of the power. Um, I, I appreciate the sentiment of it trying to reduce costs, um, but I, I'm just not sure if there's a high value there. Um, and in the alternative, we could lower the distributed generation obligation by the amount of RECs we think are out there. And so um, that would achieve the same purpose. Um, there's a there's a couple of provisions, at least, that I don't think have been well discussed or vetted. One is uh, just an increase in the allowable rate increases for small utilities with uh, without much process. Right now, there's a provision where if a if you had a full blown rate case recently, you can um, up your rates by two percent with really um, a light regulatory touch, and the bill increases that to three percent. Presumably, that's to accommodate rate impacts associated with um, the res. But I um, am, I, I just, um, I actually don't have a strong opinion on it right now, but I want to highlight it that it's, it hasn't been really discussed and whether that is a, um, a good thing or not. Um, the bill also allows tier three over compliance without regard for cost. So it, it says uh, you can, there's no penalty for over uh, over complying your tier three obligation. And I, I think that could be okay as long as it's still cost effective investments for the utility. It basically the language takes um, the prudency determination away from the public utility commission. And that uh, that isn't appropriate. We don't wanna give utilities a blank check to kind of um, uh, do what they want with rate to payer money um, in the name of tier three climate. Um, I think the alternative compliance payment language is unclear. What happens if you don't um, if you don't do a, if you don't actually comply with the requirements? Um, and it seems to me that it it could be read to require the ACP, the alternative compliance payment to be set in an amount that ensure the requirements are met. So that it says the PUC set the ACP in a way that ensures that um, projects are built. That's, that's how I read it, whether that was the intent or not. And so then the PUC is required to say, well, projects can't be built for more than 10 cents a kilowatt hour more than avoided cost. We have to set the we have to set the ACP at 11 cents or 12 cents. And that, I don't think that's the intent. What I recommend is a really clear statement from the legislature of this is the amount above which we're not willing to pay. Um, and so I, there's for the regional tier, there's a clear statement in there of $40 per megawatt hour is the alternative compliance payment. So utilities will not pay more than $40 a kilo, uh, megawatt hour more to develop new renewable energy or to purchase it regionally, um, they will choose to pay that alternative compliance payment and it kind of sets a cap. And I think that's a really important cost containment measure. I recommend applying that $40 a megawatt hour to all new generation and, and maintaining the uh, current tier one for uh, alternative compliance payment. Um, and um, with that $40 a megawatt hour, I think it was set to align with Massachusetts. I think that makes sense. We are in a regional market. And so even with our local tier, tier two, aligning that value with the regional market makes sense as well. And um, because solar projects will be developed um, in, in Vermont, they'll be developed in the region. And um, as our polling showed, Vermonters don't care if it's in state or not, as long as they have access. And so let's just set it at $40 a megawatt hour and uh, have it be consistent. And, and then um, finally, uh, reporting should be streamlined. Um, there's a provision in 2029 for a um, 
joint report, report between the um, department and the Public Utility Commission. I think that should be one or the other, um, not, not both of us together. Um, it could be a Public Utility Commission process that we provide input into, or but we need one entity to have responsibility. And then we have a, a we have another a whole bunch of reports reporting um, efficiencies we could propose. Um, we have an annual energy report. We have a renewable energy standard report. We have a renewable energy standard biennial report. We have a net metering report, and they all have different provisions on what to report on that are not all current. And so we could propose some improvements generally to those. Um, these ones are really minor. Um, Self-managed utility is referred to as a retail electricity provider. They only have one customer. I'm not sure if that's quite accurate. I recommend just referring to them by the statutory provision that enables a self-managed utility. I think that makes a lot more sense. And then um, there's a provision in hydro credits, which um, actually was not changed on page 23 substantially, but it actually, when Hydro was given an exemption earlier on, um, those two provisions may, um, may be in conflict now and may need to be aligned. Okay, so I think that that's the end of my prepared slide. Sorry, I went a little bit long here. Thank you for your testimony. Members, we've and for taking questions along the way it was really helpful. We're going to take a five minute break. We are going to reconvene our hearing on H289 and welcome Green Mountain Power, um, Chris Morgan and, and Josh, Josh Castingay. Good morning. Hi, Thorne Records, Candace Morgan from Green Mountain Power. Hi, and I'm Josh Castingay from Green Mountain Power. Um, I think we uh, are here today to uh, walk through. Um, you know, parts of the framework that really impact Green Mountain Power and what we think about that. And then we were listening, obviously, to the morning testimony a little bit. So Josh is our leader of innovation and engineering and can kind of talk a little bit about, um, you know, what we see on the grid, some of the other innovative work that we're doing, um, and can also talk about any questions that folks might have related to some of the programs that we offer for um, income qualified customers and other work that we're doing in that space as well. So those are kind of the three big things I think we were planning to talk about, but also happy to answer any questions that folks have. Um, we don't have specific slides, but that was kind of the big the framework that we were planning to work within. Um, and we'll keep it short because I know you also have a morning full of witnesses as well. Um, so on the first part of it, as we outlined when I was here, I guess it was a couple weeks ago now, I can't remember. Um, we are supportive of the framework, and I think the draft that you all have reviewed in committee um, version 1.2 largely reflects a lot of what was a part of that um, consideration. I think there's some you know, technical changes and other um, items that folks have shared, and we'll continue to work through that and um, review as you all look to finalize your work in this space. Um, but for Green Mountain Power, we are supportive of going to 100% renewable by 2030, which is what the bill outlines for us, and then also includes the increase to tier two as defined in the bill by 2032. Um, and so that is the smaller scale distributed generation, um, largely here, here in Vermont connected to our grid. Part of the reason why we um, are comfortable with that, recognizing of course that it is a pretty big increase from current law. Um, there are some provisions in the bill that uh, change the date, kind of goes back to 2010, so can um, include uh, projects that have come online and that are being supported in our communities already, which we think is an important thing to reflect the good work that Vermonters have done to bring on renewable energy projects. And so that is a key part for us. It also includes some of our um, smaller scale, low impact hydroelectric facilities, which are another key resource for us in our fleet. I think as I hit last time, it's all about balance, both in types of resources, where they're located, um, when they operate and generate as well. And so that's another key um, component there. And then also the elimination of the more expensive group net metering, which I know has gotten a bit of a tension in conversations that folks have been having in this space. It does not mean that we um, are eliminating a pathway for community solar. I mean, we've got a lot of great programs in line that Josh can talk about and work that we want to continue to do in this space as well. 
Um, it's just really about that uh, compensation structure for those types of projects that drive up costs for all of our customers. Um, and then the other part of the framework for us would be the um, what we had been calling tier 1A, but I think as drafted would uh, be under the sub four of that section, um, the larger, newer renewables, um, which people have largely referred to as like a larger regional tier focused on potentially offshore wind or onshore wind, if it, you know, is um, in other locations, anything that is capable of being delivered into the region. Um, and that would bring us to 20% for that by 2035. Then there's some of those provisions in there that are also key for us in terms of recognizing um, an opportunity to reflect on whether the resources are available in a way that can work for um, customers from a cost perspective. So there's a check-in as well to reflect, um, you know, seeing what's happening in the region. Um, and so for us, those are that's the sort of big framework. And like I said, I think the version that you all have before your committee largely reflect, reflects that too. Um, and so. That is, um, yeah, that's where we're at with that. I'm happy to answer any questions on that part and then can turn to some of the other items from Josh. Cool, thank you. So I think maybe we wanna hit the, um, some of the conversations around um, grid impacts and you know what we see um, in terms of how we manage all of that at GMP um, and then can turn to some of the other um, programs that are underway. Yeah, so, you know, when we think about the grid impacts, so GMP, like all the utilities, we, we do these, these studies, we look ahead at the system, we have something called integrated resource plan and IRP, where we look at exactly this, which is heavy electrification, heavy distributed generation, different scenarios. Um, when it comes to building more distributed generation on, on the system, one of the one of the best things that can happen that supports that is electrification. So as we decarbonize, transportation, heating, a lot of times that means electrification, 3Vs, heat pumps. It just so happens that while doing that, and at the right time, soaking up, say, solar, which is most of the distributed generation, then alleviates some of those concerns. So as you look at and you hear more about impacts to the overall system, the assumptions behind what happens with electrification are key. So that is a big piece of um, allowing to continue uh, this growth. In addition to that, um, you know, through the electrification, being flexible with the load, we call it flexible load, but, you know, an EV, for example, you can change when you charge it or not. Eventually, you'll be able to discharge it, like you, you know, Ford Lightning, as Gabrielle yeah, mentioned this morning, uh, the, you know, you can, you can um, leverage those vehicles to do more than just charge and drive around, but you can actually use them as grid resources. So that electrification, as we decarbonize through all the other programs that we have is actually going to support the growth of the distributed generation at the same time. Um, you know, we've been doing a lot around battery storage. And I know there's been a lot of discussion around storage that continues to be a resource. There's, um, you know, we see it as one, you know, an incredible resiliency resource for customers, helping customers ride through power outages during more and more severe weather and storms. And then number two, leveraging it to do all of these different things, including managing the grid. It's an incredibly flexible tool that we use to soak up solar in the middle of the day, hit the peak time, which may be at 7 or 8 or 9 p.m. at night, on a cold February night, discharging the storage. So leveraging those resources um, as well. There was there was mention, too, of, of curtailing and managing the, the generation itself. You can curtail resources. I, I always look at that as kind of a last resort. You know, if we can produce the renewable energy and then soak it up and then use it later, that's going to be preferred. But that is it is an option. So when we lay out these studies, we look at, you know, 10, 20 years out and all of these scenarios um, in terms of high penetration of distributed generation, both what if it just goes anywhere and what if it's more optimized in terms of where it gets built and the electrification. And, you know, everybody has an EV, everybody's switching to a heat pump and heat pump systems. And what does that look like on the grid and how do we manage that? So those two things together are really key as we as we look forward um let me hit income sure. qualified so just to, to quickly hit i know there's been a lot of i'm oh, sorry question, if you don't mind yeah. representative yeah, thank you uh <clears throat> what can you tell me about evs not charging well when it's very very cold is there truth to that or is fox knows off you mean not yes they are <laughs> so if you're talking about 
fast charging. So you're driving an EV and you get to a fast DC fast charger, depending on the temperature of the battery and things going on, it may, they, it won't be zero, but it may not be as fast as you possibly could charge. So a lot of times, um, if a charger, a fast charger is rated for 150 kilowatts and you just show up to it and you haven't been driving for a little while, which usually isn't the case, but if you just get there, the car is still cold, it's gonna charge at like 50% rate. So it'll be slower until things warm up. The batteries like to be kind of warm when they go to fast charge. Sure. When you plug in at home or on a, what's called a level two charger, you're usually always gonna get full power there. So, um, so cold batteries will start to charge a little slower, but it's not zero and then it, it warms up and you get full. There are some issues then. I mean, I usually, so the way that fast charging works is you've been driving for a while, you get to the fast charger, you plug in, usually things are warm, so you're getting full power. So I'd yeah. call it a very minimal issue. Yeah. Good, thank you. Um, sorry, good. So income equality, just to quickly hit, uh, you know, GMP, like like the other utilities in Vermont have done a lot of work and continue to focus on how to make sure, one, all of this is accessible to, you know, to all of our customers and all Vermonters, two, how it benefits all of our customers, whether they're participating in the program or not, um, and how we, you know, make sure as we decarbonize, we do resiliency, everybody can take part regardless of uh, income or their ability to. And so, you know, we've had a number of programs over the years from our straight up, we have an EAP, Energy Assistance Program, very straightforward income qualified program where customers get a 25% discount on their electric bill period if they meet, if they're at 185% of the federal poverty level. That's just across the board, anybody can apply. They meet that income threshold criteria um, that is funded through a, a fee that's been on the electric bill um, for decades. Um, there's, we've had a, so we call it a solar EAP, similar, similar approach, um, allowing customers to connect and get that same credit connected to a solar project. So no cash or capital outlay from the customer, they simply, have a connection to a solar project essentially, and they get that same credit. So it's a way to sort of take part in, um, in a solar project, something we piloted. This was on a multifamily uh, home in Berlin actually. Um, and same sort of thing. There's a credit on the bill works out to about 25% and they've got the solar facility that's connected to that. We've done a few other programs connecting solar and have a few coming out. You've probably heard of Acre. Portable Community Renewable Energy. Energy Program that is funded through some um, funds that have come through the state of Vermont, the mm -hmm. Department of Public Service, um, where similar to the EAP, folks that qualify for EAP would essentially qualify for this. And again, they just get a discount on their electric bill tied to a solar project that's feeding that with no, uh, no cash or no need. So all of our programs uh, have been focused on providing that benefit directly to the customer. So the income qualified customer. And what has come up, I think, on the on the affordable housing side, are there's some scenarios now, and, and not just now, this, I think some of the houses, uh, multi-units have been built with like a central meter. So usually, you know, each customer has a meter, there's a program in place yeah. and it connects with that customer. So that customer sees that benefit. With the single meter multifamily, um, we just need to, you know, rework. So what we've been doing is developing new programs that essentially do the same thing. Um, we just need to make sure that, you know, connection happens and somehow that, that benefits the customer, which can be in through a number of different ways, directly or indirectly, but we would have a similar program uh, using either type of acre scenario, mm -hmm. solar for all, which is happening in other programs there. Yeah. Yeah. Um so the proposal that we have um, includes uh, eliminating group net metering. So there's some concern about community solar, um, rightly, from folks. Can you talk about um, if this proposal passes um, of group net metering? Can you talk about community solar in your territory? Sure. What will be the case if it yeah. passes? Yeah. So right now we have um, we have a, a tariff that was filed. I think it's approved, gone through. So which is essentially, we call it solar sharing. It's a community solar program um, using, it can use different sources of funds, but it allows you to, to 
leverage economies of scale too when you build solar projects. One of the things to me that's been almost a little limiting with group net metering is there's a size limit. It's 500 kW today. And like anything, if you can find a, a more ideal location and you can actually build a larger project, you can do two things. You can lower the cost of that system for everybody, which just benefits the whole program. Um, and two, you can get more customers on one project. You just have more energy, more projects, so you can connect more customers, more um, units. So we have a, a call a shared solar program, which is designed to take advantage of projects that take advantage of bonus investment tax credits. There's um, there's something in the Inflation Reduction Act that provided, folks probably know, that have provided additional tax incentive. It's a competitive process, so the developers still have to go and apply, but as long as you show a connection to the income qualified folks as part of that process. So we have a tariff now that's going to take advantage of that. Um, we have the ACRE program uh, that is using dollars that are already available today. And we're in the process of, of taking those and essentially mirroring them to be able to do something with a uh, you know, multifamily affordable housing that has the central meter situation going on there. Senator Logan, then Morris. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, one um, is more directed to what I would call the inability, um, the inability of low and moderate income home homeowners to take advantage of on-site solar installations, and if you have given much thought to how to improve access to that for for home for low and moderate income homeowners homeowners owners or homeowners yeah okay yeah because what we you know there's been there's been this kind of why it was important to come up with these community solutions so there's obviously a lot of different scenarios physically where you live if you're surrounded with tree canopy mm -hmm. that you know it's going to be challenging um, the condition of your roof there's a lot of things that that make it more difficult to do it physically at your location um, which is why having off-site and other programs um you know obviously we're not a solar developer so i'm sure there's a whole host of other mm -hmm. concerns and then there's the the renting side of the thing and can you get the landlord on board and right everything. but yeah that's um, another question <laughs> i would also say you know some of the considerations in the solar for all application that the department put forward i think helps to focus some um dollars at those households as well so not just i know there's a big portion of it that's a Acre 2.0, and then some other work related to affordable housing communities. But there's also the individual homeowner um, options for additional funding for um, deploying solar panels on their roofs as well. And we we were happy to sign a letter of support for that work as well across the department because I think it's a helpful tool, and I we look forward to sort of seeing what the results are. But I think it's a good option to help um, tap into those households and deploy renewable energy for them as well. Yeah, it seems really beneficial because uh, then they do own the equipment and there is a, you know, 20, 30 year um, benefit to them um, in terms of what, a, 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 a much larger reduction in their energy costs over the course of the life of the equipment, um, which seems like an advantage that higher income households are getting right now, that low and moderate income households um, homeowners don't have access to in quite the same way and seems like it would be a huge benefit to those households. Um, so I'm curious about um, learning more about how Solar for All can yeah. help address that gap. Um, the other question, and this is maybe something that, um, that uh, you've already been discussing internally regarding affordable housing um, is, and so I'm happy to talk about this separately, um, but one of the, and we keep asking the same question <laughs> of everybody at this point, but um, one of the things that we've learned from affordable housers is that at the development level, um, in order to offset the operating cost increase for electrification and solar, solar installation, um, that would allow them to keep the per unit cost within the federal guidelines for affordability for those units, um, group net metering rates are what they've been using as part of the calculation to offset, offset the increase in operating costs. And 
Um, so we're hoping to fast to that yeah. as we help um, offsite group net metering yeah. that um, helps make the develop like the individual development level maths work. Yeah, and and I, I should hit two things there too because there's there's so something that happens. In fact, we're working with another multifamily. Um, development in, in the St. Albans area through our tier three program, um, especially on the affordable housing where we use the low income, income qualified bucket. There's a considerable amount of contribution that goes in right up front to make the system cost just much lower you know, or provide a lot of benefit there when they're electrifying, either doing heat pumps or geothermal or something there. So start, you know, lowering that upfront capital for the developers has to, I assume, have a you know, positive benefit overall. And then um, two, you're exactly right. So my, uh, what I've heard was that um, in natural gas territories, they, uh, the affordable housing has said it's around 20 to 30% more on the, and our EAP is 25%. So that's, you know, it seems to me to be a pretty good match to essentially, you know, net that out or pretty close. So that is um, our, the solar EAP, design does does exactly that puts that on that um, central meter and it's good like yeah like i said up until now it's been really focused on the the ultimate customer the end user this is a little different in that okay it's it's the the owner operator of the building that has operating costs um and this will benefit that probably more so than was happening when they had oil and propane at other sites obviously yeah so. um and so then it's just about developing a program that could then certify that the central metering, the developer who is, or the owner rather, of that um, central meter it has tenants who qualify. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Right, thank you. Representative Morris. Oh, thank you. Uh, quick question. Uh, you mentioned tariff in some of the installations for some of these programs. Mm -hmm. Tariff B means there's somebody's paying something. Uh, can you just explain what the yeah. definition is? Sure. Yeah, I mean, so in, in the regulated utility space, anything we do that involves a customer requires a, a tariff. So different, not quite, the, 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 it's it's basically the regulatory process we go through. So our rates, all of our electric rates are mm -hmm. tariff. They get approved by the Public Utilities Commission. Yeah. If we, um, our, our energy assistance program, our EAP is a tariff. Um, the one thing we can do prior to tariff is pilot. We have in our regulation, the ability to pilot, which is a, a limited term up to 18 months kind of test to see does this program work? And then we move it to a full blown tariff, but it's basically the regulatory speak for just we're approved to do it yep. and offer it. I think this is pretty quick. Um, the uh, tariff that you said you you think was just approved. Yep. So would this be news to the multifamily affordable housing groups? Like, I'm just hoping you guys can connect and coordinate if this is relatively newly approved by the PUC or? Um, it's not, it was approved a couple of little while ago. I'll have to double check the dates. Um, so it's not news in the sense that it has been offered. I think the challenge and Josh hit it briefly was that um, it presumes that, that they're awarded some of the competitive ITC adder credits at the federal level. And so that program has been pretty slow to roll out at the federal level. And so I think it's just a matter of um, seeing what comes to Vermont and Vermont specific developers that remains a little bit in flux, but also outside of our control. So the tariff is enabling that um, if folks are successful in grabbing those credits, we would have a pathway that kind of immediately allows them to use that in the same in that space, but um, it's TBD, I think, in terms of what the timeline is going to be at the federal level for that one. Yep. If you have like a one page that mm -hmm. can describe it for the sure. multifamily housing folks um, yep. and others interested in this area, yeah, we can send that to the committee and also obviously the folks that we're continuing to chat with about it all. Thank you. Yep. Great. We need we really need to be aware of the time. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Representative Tory, can you be very brief? I think it's a quick question. <laughs> um, you mentioned flexible load yep. and valuing that. So when you were, if you had a customer like an affordable housing mm -hmm. building, would there be flexible load investments that you would recommend and work with them on that they could then leverage to offset? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So especially as you electrify, the one that I was just mentioning in, in St. Albans is going to be doing geothermal. And so we're, we have a... Um, another pilot, not a tariff yet, but a flexible load management pilot, which essentially compensates you for flexing. You think about it, if I can ramp down the heating system during a key time, but the 
building stays comfortable and then there's value mm -hmm. to that and then we compensate. So yeah. yes, and yes, we work with them on that. Yeah. Do you have any other things you wanted to cover? No. Nope. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. We, our next witness is joining us by Zoom, Rebecca Town from Vermont Electric Co-op. Morning, I'm Rebecca Town from CEO of Vermont Electric Co-op. Thanks for having me in this morning. I will aim to be brief um, because I know you've already heard uh, a lot about this bill and just generally talk about the fact that um, before you is a comprehensive package that has a, complex a complexity that reflects our desire to move to a fully renewable world while also respecting affordability and appreciating the unique aspects of VEC's power supply portfolio. Uh, draft 1.2, we are generally supportive as written and we'll be watching closely as, it, um, as any changes get added. Just a quick note about VEC, we are already 100% carbon free in our annual power supply and have made a commitment to be 100% renewable in 2030. This draft is consistent with that and also consistent with the fact that we are looking beyond that to a world where we are not just renewable on an annual basis, but really considering a world that both for Vermont and our region were renewable much closer to 24 seven um, and the types of investment Investments both in state and regionally that will be required to make that happen. We also really appreciate that this draft provides high level goals and a lot of flexibility for utilities to procure or build in a way that works for their geography grid aligns with current power supply portfolio, which is unique for VEC and also for other utilities in Vermont. So that um, that flexibility around how those goals get achieved is pretty critical. And we also support, as GMP mentioned, very consistent around some of the offsets in the, that are in there around recognizing existing renewables and offsets around net metering are an important part of that whole um, affordability piece of how we're, how we're seeing this will play out. Um, also for VEC, we're very reliant on Hydro-Quebec. VEC has five different connections to HQ along the Canadian border where we serve. Right now we're at 55% Hydro-Quebec um, and this does provide the ability for us to expand that um, while also recognizing we will still need to invest in new renewables both regionally and in state. Um, I did just specifically want to touch on one quick thing that came up this morning, and then I'll just open it for questions. Um, one is, um, TJ mentioned this morning, one of the pieces about net metering, which is about the ability to um, use net metering attributes um, from um, existing pre-17, otherwise called net metering 1.0, uh, uh, pieces as part of tier two and his concern around selling that. And I did, I want to just note that the, the way that it's written, the intention is not that it would, those would be available to sell. It's rather that those would be available to count towards tier two requirements. So it's really um, about making sure that we're allocating and understanding that we already have a lot of these in-state renewables and recognizing that those exist and are generating on our system in a renewable way on a daily basis. Um, and then one quick small change and error that we caught on page 33, which again is around that same piece around using net metering attributes towards tier two. Um, it references this section, which is a net metering section, when really it should reference the section around tier two, which is which is the interplay between those two pieces. So just a, um, a wording issue to flag. Those are the points I really wanted to hit this morning and then answer any questions you might have. Thank you for your testimony. We have a couple, um, Representative Stebbins and Sabelia. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning. Um, I had uh, raised the fact that I, I personally think uh, as a cooperative or as someone who wants to support your members, you should be alerting um, people who invested in these uh, solar arrays that, hey, thank you for helping your cooperative Thank you for helping us to keep rates low. Effective this date, um, you know, we're going to be acquiring your RECs. 
or some sort of bill insert. And I, I would really hope you'd be comfortable with um, providing that level of transparency to people who've invested in that. I understand, and I don't necessarily disagree with the request. Um, I just think you need to communicate with your customers. Uh, and that, yeah, that would absolutely be the intention. I think what we were trying to do with the wording is to avoid an administrative piece where we then had to both notify and get an affirmation back and required on their required their action on that part. Um, so, but certainly that expectation fully supportive of notifying that that would be the case. Um, and and particularly knowing that it's the smaller arrays that would have a notification process and the bigger ones, again, as written over 150, would have a much more interactive affirmation process. Yeah, I'm literally talking in bill insert. Sure, great. Thank Representative you. Representative Sebelia. Yes, thanks, Rebecca, for your testimony this morning. Uh, one of the um, proposals in this stakeholder uh, in draft 1.2 uh, is the elimination of group net metering. And um, we've heard some concerns about um, community solar uh, with that type of a proposal. So can you talk about um, if we pass this bill, what community solar will look like uh, for VEC customers? Sure. So VEC has and has for many years have a we have a community solar program. It's about 25% ascribed. So anyone who wants to participate in um, sub uh, sponsoring panels that are part of larger arrays, I think you heard from GMP that those are more cost effective to build, um, then they're able to do that in a way that doesn't um, provide them the need to host the panels themselves on their roofs. Those can be for um, 10 years, 20 years. Uh, we have people who really appreciate participating in that. Um, we also, similar to GMP, we are just about to roll out our ACRE program, which is a low income. Um, again, same idea of using this community solar uh, and ascribing those panels to low income households. And I would also just say that our our big focus here is really about thinking, and I know you heard from Andrea Cohen from VEC last week. When we think about our membership, we know about half of them are on fixed incomes and we think about that all the time. And so really the value of this bill is getting to everyone to 100% renewable and trying to do that as affordably as possible and understanding that um, that provides renewability for everyone on our system. And then those who have the ability or the capacity to uh, move forward with solar and it's important to them or own or host a solar array, then they're, they're able to do that. Thank you. All right, thanks. Thank you for your testimony. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Next up we have Lewis Porter from Washington Electric. Good morning, uh, Lewis Porter, General Manager, Washington Electric Co-op. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm recognizing the length of your witness uh, list here. I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, I'm testifying on draft uh, 1.2, uh, which the committee uh, took, took a first look at last week. Um, Washington Electric is generally supportive of this draft, as, as our colleagues at Vermont Electric Co-op are, uh, and largely for the same reasons. Um, we're a 100% renewable utility, have been for a number of years now and uh, uh, support and appreciate the move towards 100% renewable uh, portfolio uh, for all the utilities. So uh, we're uh, the most rural territory in the state. Uh, we have enough uh, power lines to stretch from here to the state of Georgia, and we have 13 people on our line crew to keep them up. So you can imagine the challenges, both in terms of costs and in terms of uh, practical operations that that entails. Um, we're also very highly residential, uh, have a very high penetration of net metering in our territory, um, and are uh, working hard to uh, move towards uh, a, a utility of the future in which the utility grid acts uh, bi-directionally instead of one-directional uh, as it was designed. And there are a lot of challenges that we can talk about it when we have more time in doing that, and particularly in doing that in a rural uh, uh, highly uh, rugged and mountainous uh, territory as we have. But generally, we're supportive of this bill. There are a couple of things I wanted to highlight for the committee um, today, and I'll do, do that as quickly as I can. 
Um, most important from our perspective is the uh, section at the top of page five uh, dealing with Washington Electric's uh, HQ contract. There is, I, I guess I'd call it a, a quirk of, uh, of the circumstances of timing, load growth, the fact that we're 100% renewable that come together to cause uh, uh, a challenge, I think an unintentional challenge in this bill, which is that in 2010, 2011 was the PUC board order that authorized the Hydro-Quebec contracts. Um, as we've talked about this year already, Washington Electric did not need its portion of that contract, but we still uh, took that power and then sleeved it, as they say, sold it at the same price to Vermont Electric Co-op. A provision in that allows us to take that power and use it for our members as load grows. And we are seeing load growth for the first time in quite a while due to beneficial electrification and other, and other factors. Because of the way um, things are set up in this bill and in the in the uh, in the provisions of this bill, we will not be subject to the same tier 1A, tier 2 obligations that the other utilities are, but we are subject to a load growth obligation that we meet our load growth uh, on a schedule that's in the bill through new renewables. The challenge for us with this HQ contract is we are obligated to take that power. We're under contract. We will want to take it because of the advantageous price that it gives our members, but it will not qualify as uh, meeting our load growth uh, requirements because it's not a new renewal. So what we're propose proposing here and what's in the bill draft right now, uh, and thank you to the people who've worked on this for including it there, is a narrow provision that will allow two megawatts of power that we are currently under contract with HQ to count towards our load growth obligation, to count towards that new renewable obligation. Um, it's quite narrow, it's quite limited, but the financial impact for Washington Electric is quite significant. Um, to buy new renewable RECs to match up to that power would cost about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, $446,000 a year. We would be able to sell the HQ RECs that came with that power for about 48,000, leaving us uh, would net to the bad of about 398,000 a year. That's significant for a small operation that's only 1.3% of the state's power load. It represents about 2% on our rates. Um, and so that's why we have asked to have this provision included in the draft as it is, and it is included. I think it's very narrow. It's limited to that as far as I'm concerned, and our intent was it's limited to our unique situation of timing and that two, to two megawatts of additional HQ power that we have under contract or obligated to, to take and that we have not yet reached the load growth that would necessitate us using it. So I know it's complicated and uh, I apologize for that, but we, we've tried to draft this as narrowly and limited and in as limited a way as, as possible. So happy to have any questions about that or, or talk about that at all. Members have questions? Our uh, Legislative Council does. I'll check out the Office of Legislative Council. So can I follow up on what you were just talking about? Is the energy in that contract with Hydro Quebec is it? Do you know if it's hydroelectric power? Yes, it is. Do you know if it's old hydroelectric power? It, it would predate 2010. It would. Yeah. Okay. Is the contract you signed was? Does that contract go on forever? I uh, know it ends in. I believe it's 2036. And what happened? Is that right, Avram? I don't know. Avram <laughs> signed it, Someone sorry. It's a, I'm just laughing because it's a long time. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it's 2036. It's something in, the, in that range. I, I don't just thank you. That was um, a lot more clarity on that. OK. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Um, very briefly. I wanted to address uh, just two other things that we're working on in the bill that I think are are, are more uh, making the wording fit what everybody's intent is. So I, I don't think they're a significant issue, but but making the work we're, we're working with other um, parties in our in our framework agreement to make sure the language lines up with what the intent was. And those issues are um, we own the Wrightsville Hydroelectric Dam. 
we would like it to to count as the other hydroelectric dams, uh, small hydroelectric dams that are that are uh, owned by uh, utilities in the state would count um, towards our load growth obligation. Um, the the one the the one thing there is that we are not yet li uh, low impact hydro certified, but we expect to qualify as we're just about to complete a new uh, FERC license that is quite you know fairly restrictive in terms of our operation and environmentally responsible, um, and so we would expect to qualify. And we just want to make sure that that language the language is. I guess I would say the language is a little bit unclear there, and we've been working with uh, VPIRG and Renewable Energy Vermont on that language to make sure that it does qualify. So I'm just flagging that. I don't think there's anything that needs to be um, uh, addressed by the committee, but and I think it was the intent of everybody involved that it do qualify, that does qualify. Uh, the second is the uh, renewable attribute provisions that uh, you heard about from uh, Vermont Electric Co-op related to net metering. Uh, we think that those should also qualified for the 100% renewable utilities, including us. Um, and I think that was everybody's intent. I don't think there's an issue there. It's just, an, again, a question of making the making sure the language is clear. And we are fine with uh, uh, notifying and making sure our members who are net meters are aware of that and have the opportunity to weigh in. you claim any of that now? No. No, no, no none, none that would be claimable under this bill is now claimed, no. What other you do? I don't think we claim any net metering. No. Yeah. It, frankly, it's it's a testament to the success of the program. I don't think uh, I don't think it was anticipated that it was going to be as large a share of the renewables that came online as it was. And so I, I don't think it was contemplated that it would be as large a share of our portfolio as as it's become. How much of yours is sort of net metering 1.0 versus 2.0? Do you know? Uh, I don't know the split between the two. About just under 10% of our members are net meters. So, you know, a significant share. And if if nameplate capacity, which, of course, being solar doesn't doesn't typically reach frequently, but nameplate capacity is a, over 40% of our total load could be supplied through net meter. So it's a very significant share of our of our load and, and of the of the load in our territory. I'm not sure about the split between 1.0 and 2.0 in our territory. Okay, it's clarification. All right. Thanks for your great testimony. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And Nolan. Good morning, Ken Nolan, uh, general manager. Vermont Public Power Supply Authority. Thank you for the opportunity this morning. Um, I too will try to be brief. Um, I point you to my testimony last week for specifics on how the bill interacts for the small utilities. I have one slide in there that really pulled out exactly how the, the uh, RES proposal would operate from our standpoint. Uh, today, I'll just say that uh, we were supportive of the framework that the working group members negotiated. Um, H-289 is essentially an embodiment of that. Um, so we are very supportive of the bill uh, that's before you. Um, we recognize that there are a few things still being negotiated. Um, the affordable housing group net metering component is one that I think we still need to, to really work through. Um, but getting rid of the new group net metering as a general concept um, is pretty important to us in the bill, um, both from an economic standpoint, um, of, the cost for the, the energy that's provided, and also from a reliability resiliency standpoint. Um, net metering is really originally intended for customers to be able to reduce load at their site. Um, when you start building 500 kW generators out on farm fields and then having to move that power to the load, you actually can create systems on the uh, issues on the distribution system uh, instead of improving the situation. So. We'd like to get back to a structure that is primarily focused on uh, load reduction at the load point for net metering in particular. And this bill will move us in that direction. Um, there were, I understand there was one question on how uh, Vermont Public Power would handle the future new renewables. There was a section in, in the statute uh, the bill proposed talking about carving out Swanton from the rest of our uh, load. 
Um, that is actually a result of Swanton being 100% renewable. Um, and their, their treatment in the bill is with the 100% renewable utilities, which have their own path of how they're going to uh, meet new load growth after 2035, uh, where the rest of the VEPSA members would be required to meet 100% of their load growth after 2035 with new renewables. Swanton actually falls in that 100% utility section, which requires 50% of the load growth to be met. So we wanted to make that differentiation. That was the intent of language there. Um, I also have uh, three, I think are minor corrections uh, that we would ask you to consider. Um, one is literally changing a number from 6,000 customers to 7,000 customers. Um, it's on page 16, line six of the bill. There was a provision that small utilities can petition the Public Utility Commission for an exemption if certain um, things, certain purchases can't be met. Uh, when the bill original statute was put in place, that 6,000 customer limit worked fine for small utilities. Um, we now have one member that is approaching that $6,000 limit, a uh, 6,000 member limit. Uh, and so we want to make sure that all of the VEPs the utilities are treated the same way. So by just changing that one number from 6,000 to 7,000 allows us to be continue to treat them as a, as a group and not be worried about one utility kind of breaking the threshold. The, the second item uh, that we're looking at is um, the definition of how you become a 100% utility. Um, originally in the statute, there was a test that said you, you needed to be 100% renewable by 2015. That was based on retail sales. Uh, when we went through the bill that's before you in 289, all of the tests get turned to load. So instead of saying it's retail sales, the, the requirements are now based on the load that the utility serves. So it brings into it any uh, usage that's unbilled, any losses, things of that nature. Well, in that search and replace, um, the section that originally did a test for the 100% reach utilities also got changed to load. And so now it states in this proposal that you had to be 100% of your load in 2015, and that actually creates some issues. So if we could put that one, one, instance. one reference back to retail sales, it would be helpful. Page is that on, TJ? Um, 21 line 18. Um, and lastly, I'd like to address the comment that TJ Poor made this morning around the hydro and the conflict in the definitions of hydroelectric uh, qualifying for distributed generation. The original statute allowed, uh, had a provision in it for small hydro that was newly built to qualify as distributed generation. In order to meet that definition, the new hydro had to be less than five megawatts connected to a utilities distribution system. Um, and then either have one of two things, be uh, LIHI qualified, Low Income Hydro Institute qualified, meaning you were low impact, um, or you had to have a water quality certificate from ANR that was issued after 1987. That's been in statute since the original passage of the res. What we're proposing in 289 is to pull out the utility owned generation, the hydro generation, and treat that differently and say the investments that the utilities have made for some of them over 100 years um, where they've built small hydro plants that are connected inside their communities, those will qualify as distributed generation regardless of any other requirements. Um, so there was a, a definition change made in uh, the def definition of distributed generation to say, if you're uh, a small hydro plant owned by a municipality or you're a hydro plant that's owned by another retail electric provider and you're LIHI qualified, you meet one of those two things, mm -hmm. then you automatically qualify as distributed generation. The hydro language that was originally in the statute remains in place. 
So now there's a conflict because you've got a, a group of hy hydro plants that are owned by utilities that qualify in one place. And you've got this section referring to any new hydro being built uh, down below. Uh, our proposed solution is just on um, Sorry, that's right. Line, line, uh, page 23, um, line 18, to insert in that um, a, a clause that says that are not owned by a retail electric provider. So it would separate out the two. If you're a hydro plant, it, it clearly say if you're a hydro plant owned by a retail electric provider, then you would fall under the definition inside distributed generation section. If you're not owned by an electric provider, then you would fall down and have to meet the why hire FERC license section. Yeah. You know the universe of those that do not meet by high? <clears throat> um, the universe of non-utility owned that don't meet by high? Well, the ones that you'd be asking us to bring in that wouldn't be by high. Um, I'm not sure. I Sorry. Go ahead. I, th I think let me also stumble, enter into it. I think it's utility owned that are not by is the question. Yeah. <laughs> there, there, are, there are only a few utility owned why high qualify that I'm aware of. Uh, and would you know what keeps one from not qualifying? Why high typically wants to have a newly issued uh, FERC license, the, the rights bill that, that uh, WEC was talking about earlier, once you get your new license, then you can qualify for LIHI. Um, most of the utility, like for us, uh, Barton Hydro is LIHI qualified, um, but the, the ones in Morrisville, uh, Innisburg, Swanton, um, that are going through the FERC relicensing right now, they're, they're not able to get a LIHI certification until they actually finish that FERC process. So it re typically requires a new FERC license and uh, uh, pro proving to the association, it's an independent auditing company, basically, um, that you have fish passage and your uh, runner river, things of that nature. So I think um, most of them, if they actually took the effort to go through and apply, they could get that certification once they have a new FERC license issued. But most of them do not right now because the licenses in many cases were issued 30 or 40 years ago. So they're going through that process right now. So how long does the FERC license last typically? Very varies by hydro plant, um, but they normally are at least 30 years long. And it's seven. Are, uh, are there any, it, it sounds as though, um, good morning. Um, it sounds as though uh, all of the facilities you're talking about are currently going through the process, but is that accurate or are there some that by changing this language um, are not currently going through LIHI process or, you know, the FERC relicensing? Um, yeah, there, there are some that would not. Hard, Hardwick generator, for example, um, does not have a FERC license. It's grandfather. But this change was really intended to recognize is most of these communities, so the VEPSA members are all municipalities. Those municipalities in many cases started their electric company around a hydro plant. So they've built a hydro plant that provided the street lighting and then ultimately grew into an overall utility. They've maintained these plants for in some cases 100, 110 years. And what they're finding is, as they're coming into compliance with the new require, new federal and state requirements, it's getting harder and harder to economically operate the plants because there's higher water quality standards, there's reduction in the output. Uh, what we're seeing for Enosburg, Lindenville, and Morrisville, who have just recently gone through the process, their production was dropped by about 25% in order to meet the latest water quality standards. So this change would actually allow them to count the hydro generation as a higher value renewability credit, a REC, which get, brings them some economic, uh, economic value so that they can put the investments in to maintain the hydro plants and still meet the new water quality standard. 
Yeah, go ahead. I guess I'm just concerned um, about, and I understand the balancing of if you're reducing your flow, you're not creating as much. And so how can you balance that with a higher value rec? Um, I am concerned about the locations that might not be going through the LIHI and by putting this language in, you know, um, what that means for, right now we're talking about an energy bill, but what that means for our other committee responsibility, which is environment. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, all of the hydro plants that require a FERC license, which is the vast majority, need to go through the water quality standards and that they need to comply with the latest regulations. There are a couple of hydro plants that, because of their timing of when they were built and the criteria that were in place, they have not required a FERC license or a 401 certification from ANR. That to me is a separate issue from whether they're economically able to be viable and, and maintain the plant. Um, it may be a separate environmental conversation as to whether those should be pulled in and have some further permitting done. Uh, but right now, the focus that, that I have on this is trying to make sure that economically we can comply with the tier two changes that are going on and keep those local hydro plants operating. And you think there are a couple that are grandfathered in? The only one in the VEPSA membership that I'm aware of is the Hardwick's uh, generator, which actually was pretty much destroyed by the recent flooding and they're going through the process of rebuilding right now. Thank you. So where do we, um, can you give us a list of the dams that are in the different categories here um, in your? Which ones have lie high, which ones are FERC licensed and then which ones aren't? I don't have that with me, but I can certainly give the committee that. That would be really helpful if we consider this request. Um, all right, Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for your presentation. I just, in your January 11th testimony, um, under conclusions, it said the working group report accurately captures the significant conversations, but lacks many of the nuances needed for effective legislation. Does this, does today's testimony help with that? Yeah, so I, th I think the, the working group report was very focused on putting guardrails. It was a lot of what we did uh, in, the, in the committee was take, take uh, surveys, right? yes or no to various questions. Uh, so it gave a very broad guidelines for what should happen. Um, I think since that report was issued, the working group members have continued to talk and try to come to some sort of compromise, which is, is a lot of that is in 289, the bill before you now. And I think we've been able to address a lot of those nuances that didn't really get pulled out in the committee report um, in trying to put the statutory language together that you're seeing in the bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Great. Brian Evans, uh, and we have seven witnesses left and uh, running short on time. So I just remind you, that. thank you. Hi. Again, I'm Brian Evans Munchen. I'm the general manager for the village of Hyde Park. Um, I wanted to do a couple of things here today. First of all, I think that based upon my previous testimony, it may have been perceived that I am not in favor of the renewable energy bill. That is not the case. I want to be very clear that I recognize and support the value of what this bill will do. Where I'm at is that based upon the historic bill that got us to the point of where we are today, I'm fine with the provisions of 2035 and beyond. It is the point between excuse me, between now and 2035, that is raising a concern for, for me and the uh, village of Hyde Park. And, and to that end, I wanted to uh, try to provide a little bit more detail on the uh, previous testimony, where based upon our calculations, we've estimated that between 2030 and 2034, in that five-year period, 
the incremental cost exposure to the Village of Hyde Park customers is going to be about $537,000. That translates into $6.83 per customer per month. Now, seemingly that doesn't seem like a lot, but when you contrast that against the previous testimony that indicated that the highest amount that another the average utilities were going to pay, which was $4.70 per, cus per customer per month, our cost is going to be 43 45% higher than all the others in the state of Vermont. Okay. That that is that is a cost, and recognizing that um, you know that the uh, poverty rate in Hyde Park is at about eleven percent. Under when we take a look at the Environmental Justice Act requirements that we're now having to take a look at as we move forward with other regulation, when we take a look at that, that's going to put even a more disproportionate burden on the people that are low income. And we don't we don't have the mechanisms within Hyde Park to create offsets to that. So when we take a look at the, um, the previous decision, which uh, enabled the portfolio that we put in place, which is over 90 percent uh, clean, um, which is based upon a combination of the legislative directive um, plus what the uh, board of trustees did in adding to the further resources. The only resources that we have that are beyond renewable or clean are those that come from our interchange with ISO New England, where ISO New England system power backfills in where we have needs. That being a combination of all the ISO resources, that's the only part that we have not established as being either clean or renewable. So I just wanted to kind of illustrate the fact that Hyde Park has aggressively put forward a portfolio that is a recognition of the legislative policies plus the local policies that were established over the years. Now, one of the things that you, I think in the bill you've highlighted is a recognizing a difference between the uh, categorization of utilities. Um, and there are many mechanisms that could be done. One that I wanted to share with you and I provided in my testimony today is a mechanism that the, the federal agencies, the Department of Energy, the Energy Information Administration, and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission use as a threshold to differentiate between large utilities and smaller utilities, a retail sales value of 4 million kilowatt hours. That is a, a threshold that allows for the feds um, and to allow for differentiation um, and performance requirements as, um, you know, in various federal requirements. So I just, I've offered a suggestion for how that could be built into um, the bill going forward, recognizing the differences. Um, but, you know, uh, we're open to anything that recognizes a deferral of the, cur of the current 289 proposal until 2035. We're happy to plan for and build for uh, the period beyond that, which is after our uh, our retirement, our reti uh, the retirements of our existing portfolios go away. We're happy to plan for the new requirements as of 2035. With that, that concludes my testimony. Thank you for your testimony, Representative Tory. Very quick question, uh, just my own ignorance. What? It, how does your current electric rate compare with other utilities? Are you I've been asking that? that question myself. Um, and I'm trying I'm trying my our retail rate, I believe, uh, right now is probably mid ground to the other uh, utilities. But we are also looking at a number of escalating factors that are going to be hitting our utility in the next five years in order to keep up with some of the other activities that the other utilities are doing. For, for example, we do not have AMI metering. We are the only utility in the state of Vermont that does not have AMI metering. We've forecasted right now that that cost could be upwards of three quarters of a million dollars for Hyde Park to put in AMI metering. That, and that will have to be recovered somewhere. So these are some of the things that we're looking at. 
Members have further questions? Just to, at its simplest form, are you, are you really asking to be exempt until 35? Yes. Bottom line, yes. Um, Thank you very much for your time. Okay. Michael Lazorsha. Michael Lazorsha, Stowe Electric Department. Hello. I uh, submitted a, a filing that has a series of fact sheets just for your information about our system and what we're doing. The uh, Two key points just to bring out on the first fact sheet is just our current RES portfolio. So it's all out there for folks to see it and understand it. It also shows our resource mix and it shows the value of Seabrook to our carbon free portfolio now, 18%. So again, I mentioned before, large hydro, nuclear, we see it as a valuable resource and a bridge resource to the future grid, laying it out there for folks to see. And then some quick bullet points on our micro hydro project. That's what we're thinking for the hydro. I submit a series of questions for the committee. Don't think it's worth going through all the questions, saving folks time. But we'll jump down to four, which is on page 18, lines 18 to 21. My reading of that is it narrows the, the focus of munis to just VEPSA munis. So if I'm correct in that reading, I just ask to apply to all municipal utilities. Not just, ex not just to the BEPSA members, which Hyde Park, Stowe Electric are not members of BEPSA. Number five, which is what Ken was getting to about the lie high certification for hydros. Unbeknownst to Ken's testimony, I put in what I think is a, a valuable change, which is essentially just recognizing micro hydro. So our facility is about 168 kilowatt, I went through the LIHI website, took a quick look at it. And for me, if you were to exempt muni owned hydros, 500 kilowatts or less from the LIHI certification, that would be a benefit to Stowe, benefit to small munis. I think we'd see an encouragement for other munis to repower dams. We know that's a much broader, more complicated question. I personally see value in repowering certain dams, removing other dams where it makes sense. I think this would bring some clarity to that and potentially move forward either dam removal or dam repowering. I think Ken's proposal is actually cleaner and easier. Just allow munis who own hydros to be exempt from LIHI certification. Um, you know, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in LIHI certification, but we will go through the FERC process, which we're doing now. So to my mind, there is no additional benefit to Stowe's micro hydro for LIHI certification, except additional staff time, my staff time, expense to the utility, and more things for me to keep track of. So I can pause there. Georgia suggests that I think we should consider smaller hydros, especially that are muni owned, because I think there's a value to the grid, a value to what municipalities are doing, as you see with our program, it's going to be an on-bill credit for low-income customers. So to me, that's the value of the, of the program. Again, I've got to go through FERC licensing. That's all the folks, A&R, CORE, the whole, whole group there. So I do not personally see an additional value to our hydro for an additional certification from, from LIHA. Other than that, um, just hearing Ken's testimony, I agree with the 7,000 meters. Still, we're, we're pretty far from that number, but... I'm always here to advocate on behalf of munis, and I do think that's helpful to his membership, so we should allow for that. Beyond that, that's all I have. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Um, thank you for your testimony and for coming in today. Um, how many how do you have to use? Is it just the one that you're trying to get online, the hydro, or is, are there others? There, that are there, is a, there is a potential... One potential in so, and then in, in a, another hydro in a different service territory, which we wouldn't own or operate, that we've been asked to provide feedback on. But there is an additional dam in Stowe's territory that we've been asked to look at in terms of repowering. Right now, we have no plans to do that. And 
quite honestly, I don't know that I could manage two hydros, but, but the point is, is that there's a potential here to move the needle on dam removal or repowering dams, which I think will, will flow beyond just simply energy and hydro. I think what I try to do is think of decision points, right? Forcing people, having people make decisions. And I think there's ways we can move the needle on that conversation while benefiting still electrics facility. Right. So, but to be clear, you have no hydro right now that you're drawing on, but one that's in the pipeline and Correct. another one that you've been asked to comment on or look at. just look at, which is within our territory. Members have questions. Thank okay. You Thank you. All right, Jeffrey Cram from Global Founders. Morning. Thank you, uh, Jeffrey Cram, Global Founders. I'm going to provide a, a quick slide to share to guide our testimony. There it is. And the slide I'll provide. So a very similar slide last time that we were here. We spent a lot of time last time talking about who Global Foundries was, why we were here. And we didn't spend a whole lot of time talking about the, the alignment of Global Foundries goals and, and the renewable energy standard. I just want to spend a little bit more time on this and, and go through some of the some of the places that there's really good alignment between between Global Foundries and and the standard. Uh, as, a, as a reminder, very quickly, GF Power is the utility for Global Foundries. It's a single customer utility, um, and we're in the process of developing on-site solar on our campus um, that, we can that we can utilize in our manufacturing process. We have a significant transmission and distribution system on our campus that we manage with our, with our own electricians and electrical engineers, um, and then all of the all of the solar locations that we're talking about today are basically on an already developed industrial campus, uh, primarily on an industrial campus. So to start with, um, we're committed to 100% renewable by 2030. And on each of these, if you have questions, please interrupt as we go along. There's enough uniqueness in, in the discussion points on each one of them that questions in the process may be of value. Um, we are we're looking to uh, for the tier two renewables, we're looking to hit 20% by 2035, and that's a combination of developing on site um, on our on our campus in Essex and Williston, and then purchase of, of in state renewables as well. 2035 gives us enough time to develop some of these uh, projects as we're going through the, the process now. We understand that um, better, better than before is the amount of time it takes to bring new projects online, and this gives us time to, to develop those projects. Uh, the uniqueness of, of, our, of our campus load is whatever we can put on our campus, we can use at the time of generation. We can't fit enough um, solar on our campus to, have, to actually have to export it anywhere. We can always use it at that, at that time of generation. So it's a, it's a, it's a real asset for that, that area. Um, if we fully build out our campus, if we can use every spot that we have that's really developable, developable which still only going to cover about 89 percent of our of our load, which is far short of that 20 percent requirement. So we'll have to, um, in order to meet that 20 percent requirement, partner, purchase, um, get enter into other contracts to allow us to meet that that threshold. So it really will become for us a, a, a procurement um, conversation at that point. And the other the other thing we want to just add to clarity is there's as Kind of mentioned there's really good benefits for siting solar right where we're going to use it uh, but depending on how you look at the, the various locations that we would site it you could you could total them up and say that they would be in excess of five megawatts total and and may not fit with the tier two definition today um, and so we're looking through this language to to make sure that because we have all these other good things going with the the siting of the solar that we can, whatever we can build, we can apply to the tier two, uh, tier two uh, threshold. Stop there for a sec. Good. Okay. Uh, the next was a discussion on the tier three, and, and part of 
having global foundries at the table. Is we're, we're looking at this through a little different lens um, as a manufacturer than solely as a utility. With manufacturing, we have a number of, we have greenhouse gas emissions as part of our manufacturing process. And we're looking for an ability to, to uh, append the tier three to allow us to meet the, the tier three requirements uh, through reduction manufacturing emissions rather than just additional renewables or rather than just fossil fuel conversions. We step back and look at the, the overall goals of reducing emissions. This is a really effective opportunity for, for GF to reduce emissions for GF and, and for the state in a, very, in a, in a, in a more uh, efficient manner for global finance. Do you have other reasons that you have? I mean, are there other obligations that you have we we passed an HFC bill in this committee not, not too long ago. Don't you have other reasons and and motivations for reducing those emissions? So we're so global. So we have globally we're we're working on manufacturing emissions across our company, um, and so there there's motivations for us to do this as a as part of our um, I would say our ESG program where we're trying to reduce reduce emissions. What is ESG? Uh, Environmental social governance. Uh, it's a it's our corporate policy on um, safety, emissions, climate, um, energy reductions. Um, so we have we have reasons that we're trying to voluntarily move these along. We also have at most of our sites we have we have permit limits, air permit limits as as well. Um, these would go above and beyond in the air permit limits that we have um, as far as these reductions. It's not. It's not to maintain compliance with an existing set of um, permit conditions, but it's it's a it's a to go above and beyond those, those conditions. But um, are there other statutory obligations that you have? Maybe Ellen has some thoughts. Well, I think they actually. I think manufacturing HFCs are not included in this the phase down under our statute. I'm double checking now, but I think the specific ones they use are not included. You know, I wasn't aware of others, but sure. What's up? I, I wasn't aware of other requirements, so thank you. I know. Okay. Um, and then the, the last would be the additional new uh, regional renewables, uh, the tier four. Again, Global Foundries uh, is looking at this as, as another 10% by 2035. Um, and that we, as I mentioned in the, in the tier two discussion, um, once we build out the, the, the rel relatively small campus or service territory we have, we're ultimately a, a procurer of new renewables rather than a generator. So the request that we have here is just to allow us to, to supplement um, tier two or tier four through any combination of, of additional um, purchases, whether in state or out of state, to help to meet the overall goal. Uh, what was the testimony for today? Thanks. Do members have questions? Do members have questions? I feel like we had a couple of questions. Yeah. Do you have one? Or um, do you? So there's an existing statute in the bill that's referenced, which is the greenhouse gas reduction credits, which we were just talking about a little right. bit. Yeah. And I'm sorry if I missed it. Um, did you mention? How is that? Are you using that statute currently, and how to how much? So we have not we have not, not used it today. Not. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks for your testimony. Okay. Thank you. Just, just a Madam Chair, if I can, there's just a confirmation. Okay. So the power that you're generating on site. Mm -hmm. It's 100% contained on site. So the power that we are going to be from the from the solar, um, we would we are to be interconnected into Green Mountain Power's um, distribution system. Shortly, it's a very short route from the Green Mountain Power's lines to Delco back back to us. It, the first 10 megawatts does not directly connect into global foundry's electrical system. Um, but it is it it will be far less than we're using at the time it's generated. 
answer your question? Yes. Thank you. So I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Driscoll. Madam Chair, and before I start, I don't know if any of the other witnesses after me have time constraints because it's obviously pretty easy for me to come back if you want to. Get a few. So, all right, well, thank you for the uh, record, William Driscoll with Associated Industries of Vermont. Uh, glad to have the opportunity to come back. Um, I think our general uh, take on the current draft before you is very similar to our feelings about the framework that came out of the working group. It's certainly an improvement over some earlier ideas and, and past proposals. Um, we feel like that it would be improved if it went further on some, on some basic categories. Um, I think very similar to the department's discussion earlier today, we would support um, having rather than a renewable only, have renewable plus clean uh, to be able to maintain more options on the table both now and in the future. Um, I know a discussion about this has been around uh, nuclear and specifically Seabrook. Um, and I don't think it's just, it's not just about that, although it's worth noting that nuclear is pretty widely recognized as part of the, uh, as part of a climate strategy around the world. And, and also there's support for that in Vermont as uh, the department uh, indicated with their public outreach. Um, I think it's worth noting that uh, for all intents and purposes, if folks have concerns about anything regarding Seabrook, um, I don't think anything that Vermont does one way or the other is going to change the, the future operation and other issues with Seabrook as a, as a plant. Um, other issue though, I think it's good for legislation to be future-proofed as much as possible. Um, you know, we don't know where things are gonna go with either, you know, next generation nuclear or there's hydrogen or there may be other te clean technologies that may not qualify as renewable under the bill. Um, and it would be good to have the ability to efficiently pursue those in terms of contracts and development without having to come back and change something in the legislature in order to move forward with that. Um, and lastly, uh, though to be fair, and this was discussed in the working group and, and pretty much everybody in the working group uh, indicated that they didn't wanna go down this route. We certainly got a lot of testimony and input and there are folks out there who would very much like to see um, Hydro-Quebec or Bio, a certain biomass, a certain large hydro, not considered as renewable, even though they are renewable. And I think if we put that need to be renewable aside and focus more on clean, uh, plus renewable plus clean, uh, I can think it can avoid a lot of fights over that, uh, or at least perhaps <clears throat> minimize some fights over that going forward, which I think would be valuable. Um, beyond that, in terms of so these subcategories and restrictions on, um, you know, mandating uh, certain levels of new or mandating certain levels of distributed uh, energy. I think, as I've sort of said before, um, when you look at distributed generation, that has advantages which are, you know, very site specific and utility specific. Um, and I think left to their own devices, utilities will certainly seek to develop the distributed generation that takes it takes advantages of, of those um, as best fits their need. Um, and so to have mandates on top of that, that could uh, lead them to maybe do some projects which are simply not necessary. Um, and I don't see really the point of doing that uh, to the extent that that raises cost concerns um, without making any real advancement in terms of climate goals. Um, and similarly with new renewable, uh, I think everybody recognizes that uh, even with a renewable plus clean, there's gonna be a lot of new renewables uh, developed because that's just gonna be ne needed to meet uh, both our goals uh, for uh, load growth, but also cycling out um, the non-renewable elements that are currently in our, port currently in our portfolio. Um, so uh, not having increased mandates on new renewables doesn't mean that there won't be new, new renewable. What it would avoid is a couple of things. One, developing new renewable, if, it, if there are alternatives on the table, uh, is a more expensive path inherently, but also the more you restrict the the, the options of utilities, um, the more you limit, you take away leverage in terms of negotiating uh, contract prices. And so, um, the more you mandate new renewables beyond what the utilities would naturally pursue on their own, um, you just raise those uh, risks of higher of higher costs uh, without again really furthering um, overall climate goals. 
And sort of on that point, I just want to sort of flag this could be a longer discussion, but I do um, have concerns with or take issue with uh, incorporating into this legislation the concept of the sort of societal uh, benefits or the um, what's called the sort of the ad, um, ad additive uh, effect of pushing uh, uh, new renewable as opposed to um, existing or uh, clean alternatives as necessary to um, reduce the overall region's uh, uh, emissions. Um, there's a couple of problems with that. Um, again, uh, it's not that new renewables will not be built. It's a question as to whether we build more than we need. Um, uh, it, sometimes folks seem to want to have it both ways. Vermont is either too far behind or, or, or we need to lead the way. Um, there's an assumption in under the argument that the other states in New England are not going to go down a similar path as we. And so if we don't build the new renewables beyond what we need, they're not going to get built. And I just don't think that that's a believable argument uh, on practical terms. I think we are going to build the new renewables that we need to have, whether it's 100% renewable or 100% renewable plus clean, we're going to build the new generation we need. And I think the other states are going to be moving in that direction too. Um, whether they're currently ahead of us or will we'll catch up with us. I don't think it's realistic to believe that we're the only ones that are gonna take the burden to build new renewables. Um, so wh why should we uh, force the utilities to contract for new renewables that they may not need simply uh, to take that, take that uh, uh, step? I think that raises cost concerns. It raises the possibility of stranding some of the existing renewable contracts that they have. Um, it's just, I, I don't see it as a, as a warranted uh, public policy um, to go down that route in terms of cost impacts. And you're not really making, I don't think, arguably uh, a change on climate in the end, in the long run. Um, I think a few, to address some of the discussion earlier today about, again, obviously I'm, I'm talking, talking about costs a lot. Um, uh, I think there is concerns on the rate front. I think the department raised quite a few uh, that are worth uh, considering. We don't, in terms of the additional cost of transmission, I think it would be good to know more about how reliable our assumptions are about the cost of storage um, in terms of how that technology is both developed and implemented. Uh, and, and also, I don't know how much the modeling captures the competitive impact that that was noted before about, you know, the more you restrict the alternatives and leverage of utilities, uh, the more risk there is that we end up with more expensive power that we need. I think the sort of final two points on this front, uh, as I said before, we are already in a high stress environment because we are a high cost state for electricity. When you especially when you look at the lower 48 states that manufacturing and similar businesses can eat in. Um, so that's an existing pressure. So to unnecessarily choose a more expensive path whether it's even if it's a couple of percentage points, um, I don't see the justification. I think it's concerning that if we would go down that road, um, you know, we saw the news uh, with Soundview just the other day about how even now electric costs are a, a serious drain on and concern for uh, manufacturers and other companies in this state. And you have to also remember, you know, businesses make long, long range plans. They look several years down the road make their decisions on where they're going to go. If we have to simplify two paths toward a clean portfolio and one is more expensive than the other and we choose the more expensive path, that's not a positive signal that you're sending to businesses in terms of how policy is going to develop in the state and how their costs that they're trying to deal with now are going to evolve over time. Um, so again, I think, I think we can have a clean portfolio and we should try to do it in the most flexible and affordable way uh, possible. Um, with regard to net metering, uh, RECs, and some other issues like that, um, uh, I think I need to we need to sort of consider that more and sort of talk with some of the some of the uh, stakeholders about it, whether we have any specific recommendations on that. I think generally we are supportive of a lot of the, of the tweaks that the utilities and global foundries have have asked for uh, going forward. Right. Thanks for your testimony. Sure. Yeah, Darren Springer is joining us by Zoom. 
Hi, good morning. Um, it's good to be with you. Um, I'll be very brief. I know you're you're up against the clock here. Um, Darren Springer, General Manager with Burlington Electric Department. Um, we shared during the last time I visited the committee the four priorities we had within the legislation, uh, continuing to recognize 100% renewable utilities for early action with uh, continued exemption from certain requirements, uh, aligning the need for new renewable energy for those utilities with increased uh, load growth uh, to ensure affordability, uh, ensuring we can count our existing renewables uh, towards Vermont's targets, even as we grow uh, new renewables and providing support uh, for utilities like BED, which want to exceed our tier three targets, um, not just meet them uh, as part of a broader strategy. And um, please that uh, the bill that, that you have in committee, uh, in our view, um, achieves those key priorities. And we're uh, supportive of the bill as written um, based on that. Um, I also just wanted to mention a couple of brief items. Um, I know that uh, earlier um, TJ from the department mentioned this provision. Uh, we are supportive of the provision that allows for municipal utilities like Burlington Electric and others uh, to have the increase from two to 3% for the uh, non-litigated uh, rate case feature. Um, that doesn't change the overall program, um, but it basically will account for the fact that with inflation, uh, getting to a 2% rate change is, is increasingly more difficult. Um, having it be a 3% number without needing a full litigation automatically uh, could save ratepayers money, and the department under that provision still can request a full litigated rate case if it needs one, but we don't have to go through the process automatically. Uh, so we're supportive of that change. There are also two small uh, technical changes that we would um, ask the committee to consider, and I'm happy to email Ellen uh, related to those. Um, one of them is just, I believe, uh, a reference on page uh, 16, line 11, where it used to say um, uh, C1 in terms of uh, the provision that related to 100% uh, renewable utilities. I think it now needs to read B1, uh, just because the uh, sections and subsections, subdivisions may have changed. That's just a small technical correction. And we also might want to work, I know Ken Nolan mentioned earlier, a provision around load growth and Swanton. Um, BED is not a member of VEPSA for power supply purposes, uh, but we did join recently as a, what's called a strategic member uh, to be able to work together more on some programs and um, might be helpful to have some clarity in that provision that Ken was referencing that uh, BED continues to be recognized as 100% renewable utility um, and not as a, a member of VEPSA for that purpose. So I'm, I'm glad to send a couple of small suggestions to Ellen uh, for clarity purposes. Um, and other than that, I'll stop there. Glad to answer any questions if helpful. Thank you for your testimony. Do members um, have questions? Not seeing any. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you very much. We're aware next witnesses are. Now, uh, Maura Collins and Peter Sterling remaining. Yeah, that would be great if he would do that. She was here. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Apologies, YouTube had a little delay. It does, it's true. <laughs> Living in the YouTube universe is welcome. Thank you. Can I jump in? Yes. Okay, hi, I'm Maura Collins. I'm with the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to this bill. I'm going to move fast. I know um, I'm up against lunch. Uh, and Peter. Uh, knowing the realities of climate change, we see the transition to 100% renewable energy standard as a key way to achieve the goals that the legislature has set for the state. And VHFA was a part of the RES discussions and all the different groups involved in the RES working groups. You, Peter? Yeah. I have worked hard to design this program, um, the roadmap to 100% renewable electricity. So I just wanna, I'm gonna slow down and say, there's a tremendous amount of agreement 
that VHFA and the other housers have with the department and the utilities goals of lowering the cost of utility electricity and creating a more clean green grid. Um, so I heard the department testify this morning that there were three goals um, that were identified as top goals. They were affordability, meeting the climate goals and resiliency. Um, so the distribution utilities that I've spoken with, they are laser focused on these goals under affordability. I'm familiar with GMPs. I, I don't, the EAP program, don't ask me what that stands for, but the, um, the program to reduce the rates for uh, lower income households. And we're familiar with the PUC case that's looking to bring a program like that statewide. Um, and that could really go far to help the residents of the housing that we create. Uh, the department's acre program also could lower costs to lower income customers, which is going to be a wonderful relief. As for reliability, Vermont has gained national attention for the innovation to harden our system. And TJ highlighted uh, Vermont's leadership in deploying storage, bringing 10% you know, of our state's peak demand uh, with storage. I didn't know that. I thought that was wonderful. Um, GMP, Vermont Electric Co-op, and other utilities are centrally focused on lowering rates to Vermonters while making tremendous strides in making our electricity among the cleanest in the nation. So much to be proud of. It's wonderful. And I think there's also agreement that we have to incentivize the electrification of buildings. And this starts to get toward that second goal of meeting our climate goals for the state. Lowering rates while still adding more housing that's heated by natural gas or fossil fuels doesn't address that second goal. Um, and so as GMP testified, and, and this has come from affordable housing developers that building an all electric building in natural gas territory can cost about 20% more to operate. And so lowering the cost to renters by 20, 25% through a program like EAP might help those tenants. Those benefits aren't available to the owner of the property that is providing the electricity to all the common areas, the elevators and, and all that. And more importantly, it doesn't speak to the heating systems. And so in natural gas territory, they're likely still gonna use natural gas to heat that building. And so lowering electric rates to tenants when the tenants don't pay for their heating is missing a key element of the equation. Gus Selig from the Housing Conservation Board last week highlighted that a in affordable housing, we create the housing we create achieves many of this committee's goals. It's location friendly, it's climate smart, and to meet the state's climate goals, it is going to require us to electrify the homes in Vermont. And so with that, we have the opportunity to start to explore an equitable transition to electrification that will be necessary for all housing types, starting with buildings that house uh, the most vulnerable Vermonters. And so in the interest of time, I wanna hone in on how net metering under the current system shifts costs from high income households who have the financial capacity to install solar onto lower income households that can't afford or don't have the ability to because they rent. I was struck that the department testified um, in earlier reports that Vermont's top 20% of income earners made up 36% of solar adoption, whereas the bottom 40% of income earners are just 10% of solar adoption. So I am not here to be a proponent for keeping the existing net metering system we have. I think we can and we must do better. I think we have to protect ratepayers, And so, Affordable housing uh, that VHFA and VHCB finances doesn't necessarily need the existing community net metering program that we have today to continue without changes. We believe that a successor program to net metering would address the cost concerns and the cost shift while maintaining offsite solar options for affordable housing as feasible. And we need that offsite option only because our buildings are dense and small and tall and that rooftop is often filled with other things and just doesn't have the room for solar that we wish it did. 
So we've been speaking with the utilities, the public service department, members of this committee, to try to draft a plan that would create such a program and we'd be happy to participate in that process and develop cost-effective alternatives that work for utilities and affordable housing. I think we can get there. I was really intrigued by the department's proposal from my perspective of affordable housing. There's a lot to it I don't understand, but uh, from um, but we've been talking with the utilities about the fundamentals that could be a part of a successor program of group net metering for affordable housing as a new way forward. And, and I see the promise of finding that third way. I think we're gonna get there. I'm nervous that we're gonna get there in the time this committee has. Um, so what I wanna caution is that the bill as written eliminates group net metering and that's not going to change anything about the net metering that homeowners with solar panels like me have, but it's heavily going to restrict future options for renters who participate in solar projects. And that sends a clear and I'll say problematic message to homeowners access that homeowners access to solar is more valued than renters. So until we see a viable alternative implemented that works for the utilities, that works for affordable housing properties. And it's gonna take a little time to engage everyone in that. Uh, we're hearing from our partners in the affordable housing community that we need to preserve offsite options in the meantime. So I'm asking the committee to continue to allow a small subset of community projects with benefits limited to affordable housing. That could be paired with a sunset date once an alternative solution is reached, maybe a size cap to reduce any concerns about the scale and cost of the impact. But when I say small subset, and I really am almost done, but when I say small subset, I don't understand measuring things in megawatts. It's not the language I speak. I speak in terms of housing units. And so I'm just gonna tell you to you from a housing unit perspective, which is we have 272,000 homes in Vermont, okay? Only 82,000 of them, 30% of them are renters. And that's all we're talking about here. So renters. But then if you think about what ones are the affordable renter rentals, we're gonna be at about 15,000 in another couple of years. We're almost there. So that's 6% of our housing stock I'm talking about is the kind of affordable housing that I'd love carved out. But when you've heard about solar for all and the opportunities that's gonna create for that 6% um, of our housing stock, it actually isn't gonna to touch all of them because some of them already have solar panels. Some of them um, we may not touch. With the solar for all money, the state has estimated that we can actually touch about 4,500 units. That's 1.6% of our housing stock. And some of that is gonna be covered by rooftop solar. So it doesn't even get into this. And so it's a very, very small population that I'm talking about here. And if I did feel comfortable talking about megawatts, I will say it for those of you who speak that language, is that we have 339 megawatts. Yes, 339 megawatts of um, solar in existence now and Solar for all, this affordable housing thing, is talking, we probably use about nine megawatts. That's 2.6% of what's out there. So I just want to say, I don't know if it's going to be one or 2% of the housing units or of megawatts out there, but this is a small thing to protect people who the median income of these residents is just under $17,000 a year. That means just over eight bucks an hour for a household is the incomes of the people that I'm trying to carve out here. So in summary, I believe the potential for community projects estimated for affordable housing is just a very small project, um, a small portion of new solar projects they're expected to come online due to the changes to res over the next few years. So thanks for the opportunity to speak to this. The end result of what I want you to walk away with in this flurry of words is we don't necessarily need the net metering of today to last forever forward. 
I believe in the ability of the Vermonters who you've heard today to work together to get to a solution. <clears throat> but I'm asking if you could preserve the current system until we get to that answer and write something in of like, it, it exists until they figure out the details because I believe we're going to get there in figuring out these details, but we're not going to get there in the next few hours or days. It's complicated. Thank you for your testimony. Do members have questions? Representative Bonger. Um, Laura, thanks for coming in. Is there a, um, are there like federal programs right now that there's a window where we don't allow the affordable people building affordable housing to access during the window that we're going to lose opportunities? I'm most concerned about the solar for all. I heard TJ say before, there's other ways to do solar for all. It's true, all of solar for all could go to an acre program and we could address that affordability. We wouldn't be addressing the fact that we have to electrify all these buildings. And so to me, I would say that that is a loss if we lose that opportunity. Um, but the solar for all is one example. There's obviously a lot of other IRA related monies um, and each of those, I can't say definitively we've missed out on, but I'm laser focused on solar for all. That if we had to address affordable housing just through rooftop solar, I think Kathy Byer's testimony was that roughly it's 15% of a building can be dealt with on a roof and therefore we need the ability to do something else. We don't need the ability though to overgenerate power. We don't need the ability to, uh, none of these developers are going to be keeping any of this. It's all gonna be passed on to the tenants and the benefit of the project and the project budget. Um, but we do need the ability, but there's just not room on the roof. Thank you, it's helpful. Sure. Thank you. Yes, members. Um, yeah. uh, it goes against every one of my instincts really? that I learned from being in food service is to stand between people and lunch or food. So I'm not built, but best I can. Yeah. Um, trying to do that. I have a short presentation. That's a handout that summarizes what we're doing. My name is Peter Sterling. I'm the executive director of uh, Renewable Energy Vermont. Connecting. Um, let's see if I can screen share here real quick. Bill, can you help me screen share? Yeah, you got it. Thank you. So I did think because it's right before lunch, um, I would start with a picture of my dog, Henry. <laughs> That's a long morning to pass. That is my beautiful dog, Henry. And I am, I just want to remind you the reason we are doing this, all this reservoir form is every kilowatt of electricity generated by new renewables in New England reduces electricity generation from fossil fuel plants somewhere else in New, in, in New England. So there's a real important reason to update to do this res reform. Um, the working group process was guided by a group of committed legislators who demanded we bring a high level consensus to the conversation, two of whom are in this room. This required significant compromise to get to this consent working group agreement by all parties involved. This agreement was the result of really unprecedented collaboration between many stakeholders and they're listed behind me. And I would just ask you to look at that list and think when was the last time you saw that many names from that many disparate interests come together to agree to something? And it reflects the, the consent, you know, the, the willingness to compromise by all parties to get to, to yes on the, the framework of the agreement we've been talking about. So again, a couple of the highlights that are in writing in front of you. I just want to be clear, you know, the res agreement brings Vermont in line with the new renewable requirements of other New England states and moves utilities to 100% renewable energy, a significant um, achievement. It gives utilities flexibility to meet this 100% renewable requirement. It for all intents and purposes, bans new biomass electricity, new large hydro or expansions of existing large hydro and expansions of biomass are not defined as new renewables. It gives um, all utilities except for Greenmount Power access to net metering rec credits to help um, as an economic assistance measure to their ratepayers. And there was some confusion about this a little while ago, but it does. It, this agreement does allow utilities to purchase nuclear power and continue to use it as basal power but it's not counted toward any renewable energy requirement. 
We're not taking away that tool from utilities to use nuclear power as, as a baseload requirement. And then again, um, just a quick overview of the consensus agreement, but this bill is a significant step forward for Vermont in meeting the goals of the Global Warming Solutions Act by bringing online several hundred megawatts of new wind and solar throughout New England and our region. And I can you know, go through any of this, um, these numbers if you want, but like this is a real big win. Um, you know, it's a real big win for moving forward on climate change. So that's my whole story. Thank you for your testimony. I'll go back to that. While they're quite old, I'll leave. I was going to say, we don't have the dog in our slide deck. <laughs> so, but he's back. Henry, Representative Sevilla, just really quick, Madam Chair. Do we have this digitally? Uh, yes, I will get it to you digitally. Representative Pat. What's your dog's name? Henry. Thank, Thank you for asking. asking. Do members have questions for Mr. Sterling? About Henry or the rest, either one. <laughs> or what's on the lunch menu? Well, um, can I just throw one quick detail out? We heard from TJ this morning that Belco is looking at about a $1.4 billion estimate of getting to 20% tier two by 2030. We just got some details on that this morning. That That's kind of a worst case scenario, meaning if you look at a snapshot of an April day with a lot of sun, a lot of wind, and um, a lot and very low load, plus there's no time of use stuff like, hey, please um, charge your car during the day. You know. The, that's the, I think you'll hear from Shana tomorrow that that's not what they think they're going to have to do to get to, you know, get Vermont's grid up to 20, you know, 20% tier two. I just want to throw that out there. Thank you for your testimony. All right. Thank you for doing this. We are adjourned and back at one.